Uh, I think we'll wait for a few more people, maybe one more minute, and then get started. So I think we can get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to day two of our summer school. And uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our first speaker, Professor David DiVincenzo. So uh, David uh, DiVincenzo was, uh, did his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, finished in the 80s, and then did a postdoc at Cornell and joined the research team at IBM, which uh, where he did a lot of the real pioneering work that we're familiar with uh, in quantum information and quantum computation. Uh, many people are familiar with the DiVincenzo criteria, uh, some of the first conditions for uh, building a quantum computer, uh, and as well the lost DiVincenzo uh, architecture for a solid state quantum computer. Then in 2011, uh, he moved to Europe and uh, is working here primary appointment at Forschungszentrum Jülich at the Institute of Theoretical Nanoelectronics, where he is the director. Uh, so without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Drimmer, and hello, everyone listening and out there on YouTube also, I guess. Um, so um, today I will continue, and uh, let me, without further ado, uh, get my screen share. Um, but as you'll see, I have kind of a hybrid lecture for you because I, um, uh, I always believe it, when you go to school, you should have a teacher writing on the blackboard. So I want to do a little bit of that uh, uh, to, uh, uh, well, give us a, give a real lesson about something. But a lot of this will also be just a, um, a survey or a set of opinions, perhaps, about uh, where we are on uh, uh, building the tools for quantum computing, mostly. Uh, I know my title said quantum information, and I, I love quantum information also, but I am very busy with quantum computing these days, as I've been off and on for a long time. And uh, I will have many opinions to give you about architectures. You've already seen a dose of it from uh, Andreas Valroff yesterday, um, uh, but uh, maybe I'll give you a little bit more of a map of, uh, of that. <clears throat> okay, but uh, let me begin. I, I need to set up my own screen a little bit differently. Okay, now I'm pretty much set here. Um, so that's who I am. That's where we are. Uh, too bad we're not in person. Uh, maybe in another few months we would have been able to, but um, well, this is what we can do for the time being. Uh, so I thought I would again begin with uh, Feynman. Uh, uh, not to prove that Feynman was so smart, but uh, he was pretty smart. And he uh, realized certain things very early, but he was also kind of lazy that I, actually he didn't follow up many of his wonderful thoughts. And um, so I can also offer some criticism of him. 
But as you see here in 1959, he um, already felt there was something missing. And uh, uh, this is a famous lecture that he gave, uh, which also in some sense uh, started or was an inspiration for the subsequent, uh, you know, nano subject, nanotechnology. Um, uh, but he reflected on the fact in his APS talk that, um, that uh, machines were getting smaller and computers were getting smaller, but they weren't too small in 1959, but I guess they had gone from, you know, vacuum tube things to transistors. So they had uh, gone an order of magnitude smaller perhaps, um, but he extrapolated downward and he said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And what he meant by is the bottom of the length scale. He might've also meant the bottom of the energy scale, but he s explicitly says about length that he says, maybe machines will, the sizes of machines will be measured in atom sizes, like seven atoms or something like that. And then he, uh, he very well understood that the physical laws would have to be different, uh, would, be, uh, would describe that machine uh, differently. Um, and uh, so he knew it had to be quantum mechanics. And then he even says something that maybe we have to use the quantized energy levels, maybe we have to use spins. Uh, he didn't get much deeper than that. I, I believe it's in this lecture that he also gave as a, as a challenge to uh, make a fully functioning electric motor that was like this big. And then a month later, somebody did it. Uh, so it was indeed possible. You know, miniaturization was a theme even then, but became, you know, a bigger theme. This, this is before Moore's law, but uh, uh, Moore codified the fact that we would be uh, running computers at a smaller and smaller and smaller scale. Um, now, uh, I also come to this famous high point that you've heard about already, but we'll hear way more about tomorrow. So it's not my job to lecture about this, but I'm going to give you some background about this. Um, so 35 years later, um, after Feynman's first uh, declarations on this subject, um, uh, we have this, uh, you know, great high point of quantum computing theory, uh, the result that you can uh, extract prime factors efficiently, but via quantum computation. The thing I like to emphasize is that um, in those intervening 35 years, there was absolutely nothing fundamental, fundamentally new that was discovered about quantum mechanics. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if sure, if one could have moved, sent Shore back in time to 1959 and uh, put him in front of the blackboard with Feynman, he could have in a morning explained it and it would have all been clear to Feynman. There was no uh, new physical insights that were needed. Um, so, well, one can give various crit critiques about that or observations about it. It says that a lot of people missed it. You know, we could have uh, in fact gone right ahead and done it. And uh, my own view is that it's because people weren't didn't really believe quantum mechanics. It sounds kind of strange to say, but they didn't believe all of its implications. You know, they sure they believed that it explained the G factor of the electron, uh, or that they explained, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the structure of nuclei, uh, but they didn't believe that it could, you know, uh, explain all explain engineered phenomena, or that you could actually engineer towards quantum things. And this certainly implied, I mean, when I say this, the Shor algorithm implied a lot of engineering. Uh, uh, now, as I said, you're, you're going to get more about, uh, about the Shor algorithm tomorrow, but uh, I'm going to fill, in, fill you in. I've been asked, in fact, to fill you in on a few specifics, but in fact, it's a good, um, I I'm going to zero in on one particular aspect of the Shor algorithm, which tells us things about, al about architectures, uh, which will be the main topic of my uh, lecture today. Um, so I'm going to proceed to, um, to kind of uh, unpack uh, this. So there's uh, the implied uh, quantum mechanical machine. Uh, by contrast to the classical machine, you know, this, uh, this slide still tells the story about uh, the, uh, you know, this particular integer, this particular 129 digit integer and how it was uh, cooked up uh, by uh, the cryptographers of the time in the 1970s and offered as a puzzle for uh, computer enthusiasts find the prime factors of this number. Because um, they knew them, but it was hard to compute them. 
Eventually, people did compute them, but it involved a really big uh, classical computation. I'm showing here like NAND gates or something to, uh, to schematize what actually went on in these uh, hundreds of computers that were cooperatively uh, working to factor this particular number. Here, here are the factors if you want to write them down. Um, and, uh, but Shor showed that by a quantum mechanical process, um, so some other kind of computing process, one could in a very small number of steps, uh, K being the number of digits, the 129 say, uh, in K squared steps or less, uh, uh, one could uh, obtain the very same answer that you can get with the classical machines with apparently some kind of exponential uh, scaling of the, uh, of the number of elementary computational steps. Now, uh, <clears throat> Shore recognized, here, here's a blank page, and I'm, so I'm going to now revert to uh, uh, teacher style and uh, talk on the blackboard, so to speak. So Shor, um, uh algorithm, the algorithm for factoring involves three big blocks. One is you just call make superpositions. Um, the next big block is uh, conventional arithmetic. Um, uh, actually what's called modular exponentiation. Uh, I won't talk about those right now, but um, uh, uh, and then the final step is an intrinsically quantum mechanical step called the quantum Fourier transform. <clears throat> and uh, I might say the just historical observation that, um, you know, Shor's uh, paper was sort of perfect. That is, he wrote a paper in 1994, it had the whole story, you know, it was a full complete proof and uh, you know, fully recognized that these things would work with the exception of his um, <clears throat> understanding of this step. Uh, he had an understanding of it, but it was a very immature understanding and uh, we never ever teach it anymore. The very convoluted arguments that he had in his first paper on why you could do a quantum Fourier transform and why it could in principle be efficient. Um, uh, but it was actually the work of the follow-up work, which occurred actually in our laboratory of uh, Don Coppersmith, um, who actually understood how to make this uh, much smoother. Uh, Shor's arguments were not incorrect, but um, he found a way, which uh, subsequently is the way we always explain the quantum Fourier transform and uh, like it's codified in Nielsen and Chuang. Um, his, his work is not even published, except that it's his report on it is on, on the archive, uh, so it can be found. Um, and, uh, and it had immediate actually architectural significance or, or implications, uh, it told us things about um, what it meant, uh, it, what, what sort of modularity this Q box should have, which is already implied by my little sketch here. That is that uh, I, I imply um, uh, the kind of quote obvious thing that you should do one and two qubit gates in succession. That's what we always are told about quantum algorithms, but this was not known to Shor. And uh, he did not understand the possibility of modular, modularizing the quantum computation in this way. And it was most evident in his treatment of the quantum Fourier transform. Uh, but let me run through um, a little lesson on what is our current understanding, I mean current since Coppersmith's uh, analysis of the quantum Fourier transform, and it will get us to explicit uh, quantum gates that we need to uh, focus on, and that has been a kind of a continuous focus ever since, um, and uh, all sort of machine building is focused on, you know, can you make these gates? Can you make these one qubit gates? Can you make these two qubit gates? Um, so, but uh, to see that you have to see how the quantum Fourier transform works. Uh, I mean, subsequently that was understood to be a completely universal observation that, uh, that you could modularize quantum uh, computation in that uh, fashion. Also an insight of our group at IBM, I might say. Um, 
Okay, but uh, so let me uh, now give you uh, the basics of the QFT. Uh, first of all, I'll begin by talking about its close relative, the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, in, uh, when you're doing a discrete Fourier transform, you have a list of numbers. Let me call it like a vector of numbers x, um, x0, x1. Uh, a few of these things will set my notation x sub capital N minus one. And these x's are all uh, complex numbers. And uh, the job of the Fourier transform is to produce another list of complex numbers of the same length um, given by this formula, um, one over the square root of n. This factor is sort of optional. That is when you learn Fourier transforms in school, um, <clears throat> sometimes you're not, not given it with this factor, but this is the sort of symmetric uh, factor so that the inverse Fourier transform has the same uh, prefactor. And that's actually very important for the, uh, you know, jumping it over to the quantum mechanical um, uh, uh, story. Uh, now I, uh, okay, this is perfectly ordinary. The uh, integers here, J and K, again, run from zero to N minus one. And the thing that uh, needs to be emphasized um, is that, uh, well, which is uh, kind of a triviality on the classical side, but actually is important from dis for discussing other quantum algorithms, is that this is ordinary um, integer multiplication uh, because, or the reason I emphasize that is if you use, uh, in brackets, if you use uh, bitwise uh, multiplication instead, um, this gets you to another interesting Fourier transform, the so-called Z2 Fourier transform. And that's the thing that's involved in the Simon algorithm, which was the immediate uh, predecessor of the Shor algorithm. So that's just an aside here. Um, but indeed Shor wants, or we need this, this Fourier transform with integer multiplication with all of its you know, potential complications. You need uh, carry bits and things like that. Uh, so, but nevertheless, uh, well, we know nevertheless that if you have um, bitwise things, so um, what I mean by that is if the, uh, if n is a, is a power of two, which we will uh, proceed with here, then you know that there are very fast methods of doing this sum classically. And uh, it turns out that it's, uh, uh, there is indeed also a classical, I'm sorry, there's also a, a good quantum way of doing it, not so closely related to the FFT. So uh, one should view that as perhaps slightly an accident. Um, okay, so uh, we want the quantum version. So the quantum version um, is that we want to be in Hilbert space. <clears throat> and we say we have a vector in Hilbert space. Uh, First, I'll do it not in, not with this power of two notation, but the J is just a vector in Hilbert space of the same dimension as above, so it uh, n-dimensional uh, Hilbert space. And under the action of this QFT, in other words, the box up here, um, uh, Shor said uh, not uh, not just Shor, uh, it wasn't needed. Uh, Coppersmith wasn't needed for this. Shor recognized that one needed to be able to do this. Uh, that all the same factors appear here again, sum over k from zero to n minus one, um, exactly the same exponential factor, e to the two pi i j k over n, uh, and then uh, basis vector k. So that's the definition of the uh, Fourier transform. Um, I know it's if you take a course, you know, with Nielsen Chuang, I believe there's an exercise that says prove that this is a unitary transformation. Um, I won't uh, prove it in the way that they had in mind, but in a sense, the derivation that I'm about to offer you, I probably have another 20 minutes of uh, story about this, um, uh, effectively does prove that this is a um, uh, is um, is a unitary transformation because it's implementable by a composition of unitary one and two qubit gates. And that's what I'm gonna to proceed to uh, construct for you. 
Um, just as a further point, of course, because it's a quantum Fourier tra transform, it works in superposition. So if you had, and this is sort of illustrates its relation to the discrete Fourier transform, that if you had a superposition in this Hilbert space, um, say uh, uh, with these, uh, this vector or this set of coefficients X sub I, that under the quantum Fourier transform, it would go to a superposition in that same Hilbert space. Um, I'll use a different dummy index though, with the coefficients Y sub K. So that's another you know, point to make of how it's related to this, um, how it's related to the concept of the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, so now let me really get to the, um, uh, so new page. So we uh, continue on this line, but we really stick with this, um, uh, say that the Hilbert space is a power of two. And uh, uh, given that we will then note that the integers J, we have J and K integers, and uh, these integers are representable as n bit numbers. So uh, little n, n bit uh, numbers, n bit integers. So uh, no notationally then what I will write is uh, there's the most significant bit J1, there's the next most significant bit J2 dot, dot, dot. And then there's the least significant bit Jn. And I will be very uh, pedantic. This is an integer, but I'll put like 0. 0.0. Um, yes, it is an integer, but I'll, this is just a way of noting that its fractional part is 0. Um, this is also to note that what this means is that we have a bit j1 times 2 to the n minus 1 plus a bit j2 times 2 to the n minus 2 plus dot, 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 plus j to sub n 2 to the 0th power, that that's the integer j. Um, now I introduced the uh, uh, seemingly extraneous uh, decimal point, but um, part of the trick of this uh, derivation of, of Coppersmith's insight, I would say, is to, uh, you will want in this calculation to move this decimal point around. So you can have a number like this, which we will use uh, by the end of this uh, page, certainly. Uh, zero point, J1, J2, J3, we don't usually write uh, our fractions this way, we call this a decimal, but that's a bad word because this is not base 10. Uh, as far as I know, there's no convenient name for what this is. It's just some base two fractional notation. <clears throat> um, but this is, as you see, it's one half J1 as a fraction, as an ordinary fraction, it's one half J1 plus one quarter J2 plus dot, dot, dot. Of course it will end at Jn in the, um, so we'll have a terminating uh, quote decimal expansion, except we're doing bitwise. Um, so having that um, having that notation in your head will help actually not uh, takes about four steps for this to really help in the uh, working out of this derivation. So let me do a, a little derivation of illustrating how this uh, computation simplifies when you're doing this power of two. This is exactly what Shore did not realize. And he, he decided he needed to do his, um, his uh, Fourier transform. So aside about Shore, uh, by contrast, Shore's original thing, which you know, maybe is worth studying for people who want to learn you know, very complicated Fourier transforms, because he wanted the base not to be a power of two, but a product of distinct primes two times three times five times seven, et cetera. And uh, he only, he was able to do some analysis based on that uh, strange Fourier transform, um, uh, which meant he wasn't thinking in bits, uh, definitely for this part of the, uh, of his construction of this, but we will definitely think in bits and qubits. Um, so let me just take the expressions that I had on the last uh, page that we, of course our, Blackboards, uh, you can't see my last blackboard. So, uh, well, you'll see it eventually when you get the, uh, the slides back. Um, so we're just gonna rewrite what uh, the transformation is uh, under the QFT, but now specializing to this power of two. Um, I guess we call this radix two, uh, or some computer scientists would call that. Uh, this first line doesn't do anything, just reminds me that it's power of two. Uh, and I'll put in the power of two in the exponential, two pi i j k over two to the nth, little nth power k. Uh, now we'll start using our bitwise, uh, you know, 
structure <clears throat> a little bit. So one over two to the n over two. Um, so I'm going to immediately recognize that k um, can be written out in bits. And then I'm going to decompose the sum into n sums, a little n sums. The first one being the sum of the first bit value, the most significant bit value of k, 0 to 1. The next most significant bit value, 0 to 1, et cetera, dot, dot, dot. Sum of k sub n of 0 to 1. Um, e to the 2 pi i. Um, I'll keep j as an un, unmanipulated integer at the moment, but I've introduced all this, these bits for uh, k, so I'm going to write that out. L equals 1 to n, uh, k sub l 2 to the minus l. The minus l uh, came from the fact that there was this, um, remember there's a 2 to the n in the denominator here, and that uh, demotes the, uh, the, the uh, power of 2 down to negative powers, in fact in this, but otherwise it's closely related to this uh, expansion. Well, it's actually very closely related to this expansion as you'll see uh, shortly. And uh, of course I've missed the fact that we're in Hilbert space. Uh, so we have to write the uh, ket, but now the ket, uh, let me stick with my, whoops, sorry, stick with my color coding here. Um, color coding says, okay, K1, K2, K3, et cetera, Kn. So that's just a, another uh, label for that same ket, but we're going to recognize that we are going to do bits. So in the very next line, I'm going to pull this apart into bits, into qubits, I mean, in the Hilbert space, two to the n over two, I guess I won't do that much otherwise. So I still have all these sums over k uh, unchanged. <clears throat> um, now I'm going to, uh, however, uh, write this or recall that this is a tensor product. So as K1 tensor product, K2 tensor product, K3, well, I say recall, I believe all of you are pretty advanced students. So uh, nobody's taught that in this summer school, but uh, I mean, every child knows this by now, I guess. Uh, uh, every child who's been to the right graduate school, I guess. Uh, anyway, so I'm gonna pull that apart and uh, use instead of the uh, little O times, this is a, like a backslash O times in, uh, in uh, LaTeX, but there's a backslash big O times, which we use for this, which is uh, by analogy to using, uh, you know, well, where will I put this? Remember CF product rule, you know, use a big pi for products, but we use a big O times for tensor products. And this is from L to one to N. Um, and then the factors, I, I will now pull apart the, um, the exponential into its different pieces, two pi i j. Uh, remember the i is the square root of minus one. So there's no confusing, the i is never a summation index in this derivation. Um, and now I only have one of these power, one of these uh, pieces, k l two to the minus l, um, uh, using you know, the product uh, sums turn into products uh, in exponentials. So, oh, and that's not a two, that's an E. Um, so E to the two pi I. So um, yeah, when you don't do PowerPoint, you get to see the, uh, the, uh, all the wrong mental processes of the lecturer, uh, which he can get to fix. Then you can be busy thinking about other aspects of the confusing derivation, hopefully not too confusing. Okay, that's the end of the, the new expression. Now we pull this apart into mostly, or pretty much pull this apart into bits, uh, but we can take all these summations also, um, some, you know, this is some K1, K2, recognize that each of these summations uh, only uh, acts in one, uh, only one unique, one particular one of these tensor powers. And so I can pull everything inside the tensor power, uh, L equals one to N. Um, okay, yes, I have just two more lines to go. So, well, I'll still have one over the square root of two. I've also pulled apart all of these uh, square root of two factors, N of them inside the, the power. So I have sum over only one of these uh, Ks, K sub L, 
Um, and I have e to the two pi i uh, same factor as before, kl two to the minus l, kl. Now, but this is even simpler because, uh, well, we have a summation, but it's a summation over two terms. So why not actually write the two terms? So that's the last uh, step in this development is to um, cleverly, um, I don't know if I really need a bracket. I don't, I won't put a bracket there, uh, but I will put one here. So I have zero. Uh, so that is to say this, when k sub l is zero, this exponential factor, complex exponential is just one. And otherwise it's something, e to the two pi i, well, it's whatever it is when kl is um, two to the minus l, when uh, k sub l is one, and there it is. So. So there's a nice simple thing. We're just uh, turning um, our uh, state J. Notice I did this just for a basis state, right? And now I can, I can uh, say that the whole transformation is involves superpositions of these. But I start with a basis state and all I've got are these superpositions of zero plus one with some niggling phases. Um, now, uh, and this is very similar to what happens in the Simon algorithm, except these phases are sort of simpler. These by these, I mean the ones that are right here. And uh, this, I do want to manipulate a little bit further. Um, let me see. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I have one more, I have a little more space here. So I'll just say one thing and I just have to uh, feature what one does. There's this uh, object here, this uh, J, times two to the minus L. And that's exactly what we're, we're gonna use this uh, or reasoning because uh, J is an integer with the decimal point or the binary point, whatever you wanna call it at the very, very end of the number. And uh, this two to the minus L will pull it into the, in general, into the middle of that number. So J times two to the minus L you will write as j1 times j2 times, not times, sorry, times is absolutely wrong. Next to, you know, these are just bit values. So this is like, like uh, well, maybe I'll uh, emphasize it in a moment, but uh, since I said the wrong thing, I have to make sure that I don't say it wrong uh, again. But uh, so first bit j1, second bit j2, and then somewhere along the line, jn minus l, and then the decimal point, and then we have a remaining fractional part, J and, uh, whoops, J, uh, that was supposed to be a, um, an N there. Um, back to, whoops, that's the wrong color. Uh, N minus L minus one and then all the way down to J sub N. So remember this is, uh, is just standing in for something like you know one one zero one zero one etc. And then finally a decimal place and then zero 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 one 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 zero one etc. Um, so some funny you know decimal number but in binary. <clears throat> uh, now the um, because this number is appearing in an exponential, um, we will actually just lop off. Uh, we will just lop off the uh, integer part because e to the two pi i integer is one. So the only thing that will survive in fact is the fractional part. Um, okay, now with that, I will, um, so keep your memory live here because uh, I'm now gonna rewrite what this is with that further insight. And then we're all ready to do gates. We're basically ready to come back to architecture after this interlude. Um, so uh, here we are. So, um, uh, right. So I note that that finally gives me, so the, uh, under the QFT, this becomes um, the following tensor factors written out very explicitly. So zero plus e to the two pi i, and the first one turns out to be zero point j n, where the has been shifted over, you know, all the way to the almost the last bit times one over the square root of two. Uh, tensor product in the usual sense, um, 
let's just do one more factor, zero plus e to the two pi i. This is where the thing has been shifted over two positions or, or uh, you know, just one sh two short of the last uh, bits of the number. <clears throat> okay, uh, times dot, dot, dot. Uh, O times dot, 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 tensor product dot, dot, dot. Now this is interesting in the sense that uh, this is not an entangled state. Um, so it's, uh, it's just a product state and it has sort of, however, it has sort of um, classical correlations between the bits. Now to explain that or to state that now I can say, uh, uh, you know, it became by inspection, one could write a circuit for this. So let me just sort of do the inspection. So uh, quantum circuit uh, bits, J1, J2, J3, J4, et cetera, uh, quantum bits. Um, what gets you uh, almost the right thing is to um, do a Hadamard transformation. Because what, what is a Hadamard transformation? It's nothing but, uh, well, it's, say, as what's the state here? This is of course not the full circuit, but uh, Hadamard gives you just zero plus one, well, zero plus one or zero minus one, depending on whether J1 was a zero or a one. But the way you write that is to say that the state there is e to the two pi i uh, zero point J1 with our notation one over square root of two. Um, so, and that's uh, part of what's needed. What you finally need here, and you know, to go all the way to the end of this circuit, uh, should be something more like this, zero plus e to the two pi i, I didn't leave myself enough space here, uh, zero point uh, j1, j2, j3, up to jn. That's one of these tensor factors up here was that actually the last one. So in fact, you're also instructed that you have to uh, reverse the order, reverse your interpretation of these bits, uh, qubits, once you've uh, gone through this process. This is times one, by the way, and one over square root of two. But I haven't, I've gotten the first of these factors uh, by just a simple Hadamard, there it is. And the other ones all uh, are information about the other bits, about bit J2, bit J3, et cetera. And uh, it's only in the phase. So you've got the amplitude right. That is the one over square root of two is right. And so all the subsequent uh, gates are, well, we write them this way, but um, it's important to know there's a variety of ways of writing this. This is a two qubit phase gate. Two qubit, qubit phase gate. And uh, the one it actually is, is this. Uh, it's a uh, you know a smaller phase by a half compared with the um, compared with the Hadamard, and it's a two qubit thing. It depends upon J two, and it turns out to be this e to the two pi i over four. Um, so that's a C phase gate, except it's not a minus one C phase gate. It's a e to the two pi i over four C phase gate. And now I think I'll just jump. Uh, since this is indeed an advanced school and I'm not going to, uh, if I did, if I'm doing this in a actual, uh, you know, course lecture, I actually spent a little longer uh, making sure you see why the pattern is like this. That is that uh, it's just a succession of phase gates where, uh, forgive me, I'm going to now uh, quickly annotate this. So when I change this to, uh, to I guess, K, this factor becomes, uh, e to the two pi i over two to the k. So when you slice the angles by succession, successive halves. Um, and so uh, you do that for the first bit. And then the second bit, uh, similarly, that is um, uh, the, oops, the second bit, um, you also do a Hadamard. And then it gets, uh, it participates in these R gates with uh, the other ones downstream. So dot, dot, dot. So this is uh, Coppersmith's derivation. He recognized that this meant if you just count the number of gates that are involved here, um, we go down to J to the J sub little n, that the number of gates 
is order n squared. Uh, but actually, even that is not, uh, he immediately saw that he can improve upon that because if k is uh, big enough, uh, or once k gets to be like 20 or something, and you say, I want a, an angle of two to the minus 20. And they say, well, that's really small. So he said, well, forget about it. And uh, beyond two, R20, just don't do it. Or you figure out what your accuracy needed and only do it to that extent. So the uh, very good approximate gates uh, scheme is order you know, 20 N. So it's actually linear in N. Uh, so QFT is indeed very efficient in, uh, in gate execution. Um, okay, so that's 1994. Actually, if you go forward 10 more years, you find people who figure out ways of parallelizing this to only log depth, but still the same number or, or not smaller numbers of gates, but even shorter in time. Um, but I'm not going to, of course, go into the embellishments of that. Uh, but the key insights of this, and I think I'll I'll proceed another five or 10 minutes and then uh, come to a stop because now I'm going to set up the rest of my lecture. Um, so have hopefully gotten you really, really ready for uh, an in-depth dive into the whole rest of this story, uh, which, I mean, this part takes a short time. This part takes definitely more talking and uh, what you will hear tomorrow, I, I would say. And then there's a post-processing, which is also very subtle and amazing uh, and it's incredibly insightful. Uh, Feynman would have been super impressed by the post-processing of this uh, algorithm. Um, and also completely baffled by the thought that you could do, you can actually two, what does it mean you can do two qubit gates? I mean, I've heard of S matrices, but how do you shoot electrons at each other to get them to do R sub N scattering matrices? And, uh, uh, but well, you know, he, he set it up in the sense that he said, you have to start doing engineering with atoms and, uh, that's what it amounts to, or some small things, or things that at the quantum uh, level, at the uh, the least level of action uh, in, in his language also. Okay, so we're moving on here. Um, the rest is pretty much conventional PowerPoint, but I never put my Apple Pencil away, so it still will, will uh, uh, graffito various uh, slides in all probability. Um, okay, so let's... Uh, so let's acknowledge that the business of doing sure, of doing exciting factoring is to have lots of qubits uh, because you, well, you heard yesterday in the introduction that uh, IBM talks about making uh, machines with millions of qubits. And uh, that's actually because uh, in our best current understanding, RSA, um, uh, 129 would take millions of, a quantum computer with millions of qubits to do this, uh, sorry, I'm backing up here to uh, come back, oops, ah, stop it. Okay, that was not, not what I wanted, uh, keep it of course. And um, so this is even uh, showing you the uh, iPad tool that I'm using here, but we're, we're back to our presentation anyway, just to say that uh, this machine apparently takes uh, millions uh, or some smallish number of millions of qubits. That's progress actually. 10 years ago, we thought it took like hundreds of millions. So there have been actually quite improvements in architectural ideas uh, that have brought it down to only millions of qubits. Um, but uh, but the, we have only the choreographed operations of these two qubit uh, gates, you know, innumerable two qubit gates done uh, sequentially or done maybe in parallel, and actually that's important, but uh, done in computer style, you know, according to clocking and, uh, uh, you know, according to external instruction, in, according to a loaded program. Um, all right, let me jump back right into this because, uh, and uh, maybe this will end my first half or, uh, well, a bit more than half perhaps. Um, so this is to get into the question, well, what do you use for qubits? And this is uh, slightly fanciful, but slightly uh, realistic as well. Um, that is um, because I, I built it upon, uh, I built it upon the fact that these all involve uh, bit realizations as well. Um, so each of the things uh, shown in my little cartoon are uh, at first just things that can represent a binary variable, zero and one. 
So a uh, cat can be alive, uh, but or a cat can be dead, you know, a binary variable. A, uh, a ball can be sitting in a, a left-hand metastable well or a right-hand metastable well, uh, zero and one. Uh, light, I say the word photons, but uh, light can have polarization horizontal or vertical. Um, a magnet can point up or down. Um, so when those are, you recognize that, you know, many of them are indeed the basis of, uh, of bits as we know them uh, today. Uh, I mean, I point to this one. This is the one that, uh, you know, stores uh, untold billions of bits in uh, cell phones, let's say, because if you look inside your uh, NAND flash or something or NOR flash, whatever it is these days, and you look at the floating gate, you see that yes, well, now it's not a ball that hops on or off of the floating gate, but it's like 10,000 electrons, that lump of charge that uh, is either definitely on the, uh, the floating gate of your NAND flash, or it's definitely off the gate of the NAND flash. Well, it's not on something else definitely, it's just elsewhere in the environment. But um, so I say that's a very real bit. Uh, and the number is like 10,000 or something. And so it's not quite a qubit, but it's not super far away from it either. And of course, uh, light, it's various you know, uh, degrees of freedom of light we use to communicate a lot. And uh, 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 the, we used to always store bits in uh, hard drives. We don't do that so much anymore, but then magnetic domains. And so all of these had to be, well, we don't use our cats very much for bits. Um, uh, but we use them in, in show, in stories though. Uh, um, okay, so each, each of these can be promoted to being a qubit, or I would say demoted in the sense that we have to follow Feynman's advice and to reduce the number of degrees of freedom. Because 10,000 electrons is too many degrees of freedom, uh, uh, mainly because, uh, well, what because? It has to do with the nature of the energy spectrum of a system with 10,000 electrons, that it's too dense, there are too many individual quantum states. And also it's a matter of to what degree it couples to other degrees of freedom in the environment. And now I'm not going to give a whole lecture about decoherence, but, um, but of course, you know that to make qubits, you have to sit somewhere on a block sphere. You know, To do our quantum Fourier transform, we had to rotate our vector from here to there, uh, perhaps. Actually, that's not, uh, it's more accurate to say it gets rotated around an axis that's halfway between the x-axis and the z-axis. Uh, let's, uh, I wasn't thinking about doing this, but why not? Um, you know, if you think of uh, what is a Hadamard transformation, it's a rotation by pi around that axis, that sort of uh, 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 angled axis, 45 degree angled axis, but that will rotate zero around to uh, zero plus one over two, one of the building blocks of our QFT. Um, and, uh, but to have that, I mean, can, can we have that for these objects? And, uh, you know, here's a uh, piece of art that I clipped out of a paper. So people, of course, write down that you can make superpositions of cats, but that's all wrong, but no matter what uh, Schrodinger said, but uh, Schrodinger would have definitely acknowledged that this is an incomplete or incorrect description of the state because the environment, at least the environment inside the box containing the cat uh, also is involved. Uh, when the cat dies, the, all sorts of other degrees of freedom inside the box get changed, and that's missing in this state. So you need a cat here and here to say all the other things that happen uh, when the cat dies. So this is not true, and you can't make a, a qubit out of a cat for sure. Uh, if you uh, do a flash memory with one electron, then you for sure can uh, make superpositions, and the physical phenomenon that we refer to is quantum tunneling. Uh, to go from one metastable well to another. And I'll give you an explicit example of that after the break. And, uh, and if our magnet consists of one elementary particle, then it's not even so special. <clears throat> the north and south, you know, the up and down are not even very special. That is that for the uh, spin of an electron, the, uh, you know, the state vector pointing in any direction whatsoever is, uh, is a, uh, can be as absolutely valid as uh, as any other. You know, if I uh, usually say, oh, it's important that it has spin up and spin down, but that's with re reference to some magnetic field direction. But the magnetic field direction can be anything. So uh, so so any state on the 
a block sphere is equally good. And one has to account for that in discussing decoherence of things like electrons, uh, qubits. Usually you indeed break the symmetry externally by putting on a magnetic field. Um, okay, so that's, I'm gonna indeed start getting into um, other material. <clears throat> uh, do, we, uh, do we break briefly? Um, I will uh, at least pick up my, my teacup. Yeah, we're about halfway through. I think it's a good time for a break. Um, <clears throat> of course, I haven't quote covered very much, but uh, uh, well, we have vast, uh, vast uh, pieces of information to be told about, uh, about Shore, uh, but this gets us into uh, some parts of that. And of course, I haven't told my architectural, my tool story very much at all yet. So are there indeed um, questions or thoughts uh, I can look at my Q and A myself. Uh, uh, I don't think we have any in the in the Q and A yet, but no, okay. um, maybe I can start it off. Um, can you use the quantum Fourier transform algorithm you showed to speed up the calculation of Fourier transforms, like normal Fourier transforms, or is it? To... Um, no, I would say not. Uh, uh, this was always, uh, you know, a potential. Uh, well, I wouldn't say confusion, but it just. You have to understand it works in a different domain. That is that it is indeed, um, let's go back to this, uh, maybe it's here. Say, well, there's a Fourier transform in action and it's taking the coefficients, uh, uh, precisely the numbers that I'm supposed to Fourier transform classically and turning them into the numbers that I want classically for the Fourier transform. The trouble is they're state coefficients, so they're not uh, something that are, are sitting there in front of you. You have to make measurements of the quantum state and you can only learn little bits and pieces of this. And once you account for that, then this is not actually a good way to, uh, to do a classical fast Fourier transform. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so I don't see any uh, questions in the Q and A. People are encouraged to ask, but... Um, no, I'm perfectly happy to uh, roll right on because uh, uh, by the end there, well, there are vast other things to ask questions about. And, uh, uh, but I promise that I will be finished. Let's see, it's now uh, 52 after the hour and I'm shooting to be finished in uh, uh, well less than an hour. Also in 45 minutes or so, I should be wrapped up easily. Um, so uh, I'll make that as a definite target. Maybe I'll even say I'm, I'll shoot for 35 after the hour and then we'll have a good long time for discussion and also a tea break or coffee break uh, after that, okay? Um, okay, so I decided to feature first the qubit that is most directly related to, uh, well, this picture that, uh, and that was uh, itself quite a technological adventure that, um, uh, now, I mean, as I say today, and maybe for the last 10 years, we've had uh, it's been commonplace to have uh, flash cells which manipulate 10,000 electrons at a time. That, that's an already an incredible you know, reduction. I mean, it's most of the way towards uh, the bottom as, uh, as Feynman described it. You know, his, in his time, you would have had to have, you had a number something close to Avogadro's number uh, to store a bit. So the, uh, in, in, been, where it was incredible you know, reduction, but still to go from 10,000 to one is uh, some work. And, um, and as of 20 years ago, that had not been done. But uh, with the impetus of qubits of saying, look, we, you know, we need a program to actually realize qubits, um, uh, there were efforts underway. Now, at that time, there were already microstructures of the form kind of shown here, which are very nice uh, pieces of semiconductor physics where you have uh, you know, layers of superconduct, of, sorry, of semiconductors, of semiconductor layers that um, in which uh, electrons can flow. And it was al already understood in the 1990s that you could uh, apply voltages, you know, put electrodes, you know, there's various electrodes here and you could apply voltages to those electrodes and man manipulate those electron flows and pinch them off. And uh, also to pinch off whole regions so that you would indeed have a puddle of electrons in, uh, in some region like this. <clears throat> and uh, according to the technology of the 90s, uh, you could have a number of electrons um, of you know, maybe 100 or something. So it was definitely already well below this uh, technological 
you know, iPhone technology uh, uh, scale that we have today, but def also not really quantum, uh, but it was important. Uh, we knew, or, you know, uh, we at IBM, in fact, participated in the science of this at that time, that you began to see uh, effects like the uh, Millikan experiment, which would, by which I mean that you could detect when this number is not, not the uh, number I was, not the capital N of before, that where this number would jump from N to N minus one, you could see it like you see it in, a, in an oil drop experiment. And so that was a sign that you maybe had a chance of manipulating electrons at the single electron level. You could at least e increment uh, and decrement the number of electrons in that way. Uh, but after some years of hard pushing, you know, another 10 years of research, uh, the bottom was reached in this, uh, in this field. Uh, you know, the, uh, it was indeed possible in this experiment uh, uh, in 2004 to shrink the number of electrons in these little uh, pockets to exactly one. And uh, when you say, how do you know that? And you know it because you can in fact do this jumping in an extremely controlled way. This, this is uh, showing the voltages applied to the various electrodes. And uh, if you tuned it upright, you could have it where you change V6, here's V6 a little bit, and you see jump, and you know you've added one electron, and you can infer that it's an added electron here. So you've gotten to a state where there's two and one. Now, you don't know that unless you can back out, so you go to zero one by a similar jump and you, with ma manipulating V2, V2 is here, you go to zero zero. And uh, the big clue or the thing that tells you that where you are is then you're in a vast wasteland. That is you go, um, uh, you know, you go a, a very, very far in this scale by, uh, th this is a millivolt scale. You go by a whole volt and you don't see any more jumps. And so that infer or that implies that you've co totally emptied the system of electrons and then you just go back and go jump jump and then you're back to one one so um now i'm not going to proceed so much with this that there was indeed a fruitful time when it was thought well here's the qubit um and oh i should use a different color i'm doing red on red uh maybe this is the qubit because this is the this pair this one comma zero and zero comma one is exactly what i featured uh, here, uh, right here. And um, so that is a qubit and you can document it as qubit. Unfortunately, it's a rather noisy qubit. And uh, it was found that uh, yes, you can see effects of coherent quantum tunneling, but the coherence time, so the T2 is of order one nanosecond and uh, pretty hard to improve, it turned out. So, um, but that was not the primary qubit that we were focusing on at that time. We were focusing on a qubit that could be made uh, in this region where there's two electrons. And uh, then you use the spin states. So you actually use magnetic states of electrons to call those two qubits. Um, and uh, that has led to continued development. And I won't follow that story so much, but it still has its uh, devotees and people are still hoping to scale up, but uh, the fact is that people have not gotten beyond two qubit uh, uh, devices so far. <clears throat> um, not for totally fundamental reasons, but it seems that the, the microfabrication is very difficult. And uh, that's enough to make uh, a, a project take 10 years. And so, uh, but you know, it's still a very lively and active field and people are getting very nice PhDs still in working in this subject. And I think there are still hopes for it. It has very nice features and interfaces to, uh, to light, but I won't pursue that much further. I will, I will tell you more uh, stories about uh, where we're going with the superconducting side. Uh, recognizing you've already heard a chunk of this from uh, Andreas Walroff, but uh, perhaps I have a somewhat broader uh, perspective on this, you know, looking, uh, pulling back a little bit from uh, what you know from him or what you, I'm sure you've been learning about otherwise. So uh, let me get into this that, um, um, so at around the same time, uh, well, I, indeed all of this was kicked off by Shor's algorithm, I would say, that is that, uh, 
this was all completely just mathematics and people playing around up to that time. And then from that point onward, uh, physicists immediately jumped in and said, can I do this? And uh, so um, it was actually, a bit, in a sense, a slower start to, uh, to pursue these objects, although they were known from about, I think, the uh, year 1985 was actually an important year in the development of this in physics laboratories, that it was understood that you could make electric circuits with quantized energy levels uh, with no coherence. So it was really uh, very poor looking from the point of view of, of actually making a, a qubit. That is that you, yes, there is apparently a block sphere. Uh, there was also apparently as of that year, um, uh, very little uh, chance of there being any uh, isolation from the environment. Um, so, but still, um, uh, but that's turned out to be not true. That this uh, been the, uh, and why? Well, I don't know. It's the people in that field say it's because of the tremendous flexibility of the engineerability of this phenomenon. And I think there's a lot to, to be said for that point of view. And it's not because of course, it's at the atomic scale. This is about the smallest thing you ever see in a, in a superconducting processor. Um, there is a crucial step which involves uh, producing the, super, the Cooper pair tunneling phenomenon that gives you this circuit element, the Josephson junction circuit element. And that requires this moderately small, um, you might say nanotechnology, but it's like 30 year old nanotechnology. It was the same as was used in the papers in 1985. Uh, these papers were by uh, Devore, uh, Martinez and uh, Clark. So still familiar names in the field. In fact, Martinez was a PhD student when he, when he did this first work. And uh, they already learned how to do this shadow evaporation. And you see this uh, pretty crummy looking uh, aluminum. And if you slice it open and you look at the, uh, the oxide between the two pieces of aluminum, it's also very crummy looking, but still uh, nothing really has been needed uh, to, uh, to be improved on that. I'll say by contrast, uh, uh, well, this is a, a bit of an aside. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you know that people are also pursuing the Majorana qubit. Majorana qubits also involve similar materials, but uh, combined with other materials. Uh, but there the uh, understanding is there is a super high need per, for perfection. So uh, this level of uh, quote, perfection, or in fact, imperfection of, uh, of these interfaces, nowhere near atomically controlled, um, are total non-starter from the point of view of making Majorana qubits. So, and that's been the tragedy of Majorana qubits, at least so far, that uh, they are even worse than spin qubits when it, in being blocked by the, uh, you know, the inability to, be, to achieve what we platonically think should be a Majorana qubit. Whereas here we don't need Plato that in fact, uh, we can live with uh, some very uh, messy stuff. And uh, it's actually something about like, you might say the topology of superconductivity that makes this very robust, uh, that it survives a lot of dirt. Um, there was in fact, uh, this actually harkens back to what is called Anderson's theorem, which is a, sort of theorem in the sense of solid state physics, which is to say there's no such thing as an, there's not actually any mathematical theorem. It's just a sort of idea of Philip Anderson that, uh, well, backed up by some scribbles, by some mathematical scribbles involving the BCS theory that um, most forms of dirt, as long as it doesn't involve magnets is uh, not at all um, deleterious to superconductivity. And so that's uh, very much in action. So somehow Anderson's theorem has been the, the basis of the tremendous development of superconducting uh, qubits. All right, so I, I'm sure you know about this already, but this is just to say that uh, the key thing about, uh, or, or the observations is that these superconducting circuits involve uh, first very ordinary elements like uh, capacitors and also uh, inductors not shown here, but you know, with, oh no, shown here. Uh, but with capacitors and induct in, inductors alone, you can make very low loss circuits because of superconductivity, but you can only make harmonic oscillators. Uh, but with the Josephson junction, which functions as a sort of nonlinear inductor, you can make other kinds of circuits with 
sort of atomic-like spectra, and then you can, uh, because of the uh, you know the capabilities of spectroscopy, you can single out the lowest lying energy levels and use them as the qubit. So that was not anticipated in my little sketch, and in a sense, it's less classical. There's not like you can't say this works because there's a classical analog. Um, it's it's indeed more like the atomic qubits, which I'm not going to talk about, which have no direct uh, analog uh, in this. If there was a time there are superconducting circuits that realize such double well structures. They're called the flux qubit, uh, but they're not actually the best qubit. So uh, they're not the lowest noise qubit. So we don't really use them these days. Um, Okay, now who, we don't need to do much about this, but uh, of course, to going to the present, we have incredible, apparently, machines. And um, I, I guess that uh, uh, you've already had these decoded for you, but I wanna make a few points here that, oops, that um, we still have a long way to go. I mean, this, uh, but still IBM has uh, these 50 qubit devices and Andreas Walroff is working hard on 17 qubits and uh, has many things to say about seven qubit devices. I'll show sort of related ones uh, shortly to make a few points. Um, uh, I guess a point to be made here is that, uh, well, I've noticed that including on the German television last night, there was a story about quantum computers because IBM is selling one of these gizmos to uh, the German government or to Fraunhofer. Now, sorry, I'm jumping into sociology here. But sure enough, they showed a picture of one of these gizmos. And it's all sort of become iconic that uh, as far as the public is concerned, you know, watching the five o'clock news in Germany, this is a quantum computer. And you say, what's the heck's quantum about it? And, uh, uh, and the answer is hardly anything, uh, that it's a piece of infrastructure from physics. Uh, it does make things super cold. So from everything from here below is, uh, you know, 20 millikelvin, which is a pretty remarkable piece of technology, but it's not quantum. Uh, well, okay, it's, it does involve the quantum properties of helium isotopes, right? But uh, okay, that's a very indirectly quantum. It's not quantum computing. And, uh, e but even in this uh, cold space, I mean, this all enclosed in cans once, uh, once, uh, uh, once you operate. Actually, the German uh, television audience did get, get a chance to see somebody uh, pretending to put a can onto the bottom of this. So at least they got a little bit more exposure to what's, what are the next steps. You don't just you know, admire this in the open air and it quantum computes. It uh, um, has to be sealed up. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the qubits are all here. I, I don't know if you can see where I'm gesturing here, but they're just in a very tiny space, they are indeed all on one little chip and they're uh, down at the bottom of this can. Uh, the can is there to prevent magnetic fields from getting to this device because uh, one of the bad stuff, bad facts about uh, superconductors, about these devices, is they are very, very sensitive to magnetic fields. They make very good magnetometers, but that also means that you must absolutely exclude fields from, you know, the Earth's field is like a gigantic, uh, you know, huge, unbelievably high magnetic field from the point of view of Josephson tunneling. So you have to exclude it by several orders of magnitude. And that's the point of the, many of the cans are doing that. Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, I may be repeating some of what you heard yesterday, but uh, sometimes very important knowledge is worth uh, repeating. But I wanted to get to some thoughts about uh, you know, where things are with this. And this is an example of just one of the generations of IBM's chips, you know, what's actually at the bottom of these cans. And um, of course, they're, they moved on to 50 and or so, <clears throat> but at least they gave a lot of scientific information about this particular chip, uh, about the more advanced chips. There's now a bit of a gray wall you don't get to learn as much about any details of what they're doing scientifically. So I stay with this somewhat earlier uh, generation. So, um, well, of course the news is, but I'm sure you all know this. Yes, indeed, we've re jumped to the point where you could do things on 16 qubits uh, on, uh, you know, really draw and in the IBM Q tool, you can indeed, you know, literally draw a circuit and do a QFT, QFT if you want and discover that the qubits are still a little too noisy to do a full 16 qubit QFT, but you, I mean, you can try it anyway. Um, um, 
as a piece of chip technology, it's very trivial. That is, there's nothing very small about it. You can all see it uh, with your eye if you look uh, closely. So it's the only thing you can see is that there are Josephson junctions and they're deep in the qubits. Now the 16 qubits, I think I see in, yeah, on the next slide, I say, where, where physically are the qubits? And they are actually there. The Josephson junctions are more or less in the middle of these, um, of these uh, ellipses. And then as, as with uh, the ETH work, but definitely different in detail, um, there are many, many uh, couplers. And uh, so uh, the couplers you can say are there because the, the qubits are, you might say, fundamentally coupled by photons. Uh, but these are photons in the microwave frequency range. And the way a photon gets from, let's see what, yeah, sorry. Um, the way a photon gets from this uh, qubit to that qubit is via this uh, transmission line, uh, which is on the chip. But it doesn't go straight there. It, uh, it meanders around. It goes this way and that. And then it finally gets there. Uh, this meandering is of no significance, particularly. It's just there for uh, sort of miniaturization. The uh, photon, so to speak, can easily turn the corners. Or uh, more scientifically, this is functioning still as a one-dimensional waveguide. Um, um, now I say photons, but in fact, it's only virtual photons, uh, typically that you use uh, virtual processes involving this resonator, uh, this intervening resonator to couple qubits. And, uh, but you can accomplish phase gates. You can accomplish other entangling gates uh, with you know, pretty good precision. I, I think that in latest work of IBM, they're typically above 99% fidelity of the entangling operations. Um, I'll maybe near the very end, I'll make some comments on that, but it'll only be a sort of uh, uh, lead into uh, the lecture you get, I believe tomorrow about uh, quantum error correction, because that's what we see as uh, necessary to, to do sure. <clears throat> but to do you know moderate scale things, uh, this is not too bad, uh, but you would like another decimal place of fidelity to do you know, quite a bit more serious things. So, and I think maybe at the time this chip was uh, extant, this was not quite as good. That is uh, a couple of years ago, this was 95 or 97%. So enough to see something, but um, you know, it means that in, in the course of one entangling gate operation, the environment also gets entangled at the level of a few percent with the state which is not at all what you want. The ideal of quantum computing or the necessity of quantum computing is that the environment has to be kept out, that you, the dynamics is, uh, remains in the restricted degrees of freedom that are defined by the qubits. And that's not uh, what physics likes of, or physics, the physics does not uh, do that very naturally. So uh, one has to do a lot of uh, choosing and engineering to make it uh, possible. Um, okay, so we have these coupling resonators. There's also a coupler. I won't follow the meanders, but there are couplers that go to here also. So you form a ladder of couplers. And then there are all these other uh, resonators and couplers that go out to the outside. And that has to do with the technicalities of how you actually deliver control signals to the qubit and how you read out uh, the state of the qubit when you, uh, you know, when you choose to, when you wish to. Uh, you, you know, you should usually not be measuring the qubits that of course would spoil the entangled uh, quantum states. Um, now, a few more things that sort of, uh, I'm skating between sort of uh, the electrical engineering point of view of this and the physics view. Um, but I'll mention uh, some trouble that IBM exposed. I mean, there, there's this deficit, this fidelity deficit, and it was very important to form a budget for that, you know, this much of it is due to you know, process X, and this is much of it is due to process Y. And that's been very difficult, painstaking work um, that, uh, I mean, typically you deal with all the easy stuff. And so there's a host of, or several roughly equivalent things that uh, all are sitting there and you can't just by dealing with one of them, uh, cure all the problems. Uh, but one that was uh, sort of interesting is that <clears throat> there was clear evidence that there was still effective couplings, I mean, really quantum mechanical couplings between qubits that were not supposed to be coupled at all. 
So, you know, we draw circuits, but uh, this, the entangling circuits were only allowed in the, uh, in the uh, you know, running of the circuit to operate between, let me temporarily give these numbers, one, two, three, four, you know, from the point of view of qubit one, it's coupled, it can entangle uh, on demand, you know, by computer instruction with qubit two, it can entangle with qubit three, it can entangle with qubit four, that's it. Uh, other couplers are not present and are not supposed to be there. You know, you draw the circuit, you never draw a gate between one and I don't know what number this was going to be, you know, 18, not 18, but some, some farther off number. Um, but nevertheless, they did uh, very painstaking studies of this and they found that there is apparently some entangling interaction between these. Now it's at a small level. Now I haven't talked, you know, megahertz, gigahertz, whatever, terahertz, but uh, this is a kind of largish number. It's not, it's sort of not the biggest number in the business, but um, if you talk spectroscopy, it's a clearly distinguishable number. It involves many languages of number. So I'll, I'll use this as an excuse to tell you about a little research that um, we're in uh, on this subject. And we've gone, had taken some nice first steps, but still have many applications to develop along these lines. Um, so uh, first, uh, so now I'm back, I'm up to the minute, so to speak, or this involves a paper that we published um, last year, two years ago now, uh, pre, pre, a bit pre-corona, let's put it that way. I, last year and a half has been a bit of uh, like a time warp, I guess. Um, so this is first to set some language that we say that uh, qubits uh, tend, to, if you view them as spins, well, also I can just say as viewing them as qubits, they have some, well, I, I like to say spin-spin interaction because I like to say they have an XY interaction, but this is indeed using the sort of quantum info type language for that. These are the Pauli matrices of spins I and J, of qubits I and J. And uh, we have, our understanding says that typically both, both the intentional couplings and the unintentional couplings, you know, both the ones that are direct, this is a little, well, this is the smaller chip where uh, there are intended direct couplings between these guys, but not direct, no coupling and uh, nothing is supposed to go between these two qubits. Uh, but uh, between all of them, there is apparently some quantum mechanical coupling. And um, uh, up to this work, there was no clear way of modeling it and uh, of predicting how big they would be. Um, and this uh, provided for me a kind of Rosetta stone that uh, uh, it says, uh, you know, what does an engineer do if he looks at this chip or he says, this is some piece of microwave uh, 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 technology. Um, and uh, he knows, I mean, if he's a microwave analog circuit designer, he should characterize the electromagnetic interference and he has tools for doing so. You know, you want to uh, characterize various sort of uh, electromagnetic properties of this. And one of them is a so-called transimpedance. And transimpedance, a totally classical concept, it says apply um, uh, apply some currents, test currents to some part of the circuit here, circuit part to J of the circuit, like uh, labeled four, and see how big the voltages are, the AC voltages are that appear at qubit or, or at port one, he would say port, because um, he doesn't know about Josephson tunneling. And in fact, the instruction for him is to leave the Josephson tunneling out, to leave that as an open circuit for the purpose of of um, characterizing or simulating, modeling, calculating these trans impedances. And what we say on the basis of a definitely quantum mechanical derivation uh, involves a schrieffer wolf transformation and various fancy things, that we have a translation between what the engineer can tell you about this chip, because he can characterize the trans impedance as a function of frequency, and with a few simple parameters uh, that, well, you have to get from knowing a few elementary things about Josephson junctions, like their effective inductance, this will tell you uh, how big this quantum coupling is, <clears throat> including the unintended ones. And the, uh, the engineer can run this and confirm that the couplings are nice and big, what they're supposed to be for the ones where you do have entanglement or you do want entangling gates which you further activate with microwave, uh, external microwave tones. 
Um, but he can also see there are non-zero cross impedances, you know, really across the chip, you know, across this uh, third neighbor dire uh, uh, direction. And we characterized, um, so this sketch gives a few ideas. One is that the, the work of the engineer involves making, you know, actual finite element uh, meshes. So you see the, uh, the triangulation of this uh, device. So you have to also worry about the package that it sits in and you know, what conductors are above, what conductors are below, and you go ahead and model it. And then with the painstaking, so model, and uh, with the painstaking, you know, somewhat indirect, but really experimental characterizations that IBM has, they can back out values of these Js for many uh, uh, distant couplers, distant couplings. And there are a lot of them in this a few megahertz range. And this shows the correlation between uh, theory and experiment. And, well, it's not perfect, but it's definitely predictive. And it's uh, the first time that we've had a tool like this for really uh, predictively uh, characterizing these devices. And the message is you really have to talk to your engineers. You have to be an engineer or think like an engineer to realize that you should uh, do modeling at this level. I mean, you forget Schrodinger's equation. You remember Maxwell though, and uh, uh, you remember Maxwell's equations that is and you, uh, you solve them seriously, and they're not easy to solve. In fact, the, the convergence of such things is a pain and is not, is not at all easy for the entire chip. Um, uh, but that's you know, further challenge for you know, further uh, tweaking up these uh, devices. So there's one um, sort of message that I wanted to convey to you and bring, you know, give you some flavor of some of the current research. Uh, and, uh, we've taken a first step in this direction, but I believe, I mean, I'm intending to participate more, you know, from the point of view, I, you know, I'm the physicist, you might say, but uh, actually all of us are physicists uh, who are in this, uh, in this uh, collaboration. But uh, I think the further work uh, needs, um, you know, actually more serious engineers who like really know how to converge these uh, microwave propagation calculations. Okay, so let me go on to touch on a few other things. Now, I say I'm gonna talk about noise uh, uh, and fault tolerance, but I mostly leave that to my colleague uh, tomorrow, I believe. But um, I wanna put this, I wanna say if enough words about this that it motivates a few further thoughts about architectures and where we are going, you know, how do we get from 16 qubits to 5 million qubits? You know, that's uh, what I'd like to state. And um, uh, part of it is that uh, this coupling to the environment definitely has to be small. And this, these numbers that I featured here where, you know, they're sort of close, but they're not uh, where, quite where they need to be. So, and it remains a bit of a mystery for the field of how we will squeeze out those last few orders of magnitude. Uh, here's a, a bit of an overview. Remember, I, I state this is a timeline about superconducting qubits, and I could have started it. Let's see if I can actually tick it off. I've never done this before. Here's 1990. Here's 1980s, a little bit off the, the page, but here's 1985. And I, as I said, I told you this Martinez et al. paper was here. So the first evidence that there were two level systems or quantized. <clears throat> energy level systems in superconducting circuits was in that year. Um, but the first entry on this chart is here in, in the year uh, 1999. So there was uh, years of research that had nothing to do with qubits, um, but we're still gradually building the knowledge to uh, push the environment away a little bit further, you know, get rid of the resistors. Um, you know, a typical application in this entire timeline would actually have involved a resistor on purpose. So, and that's definitely bad news. Resistors have lots of environmental degrees of freedom and you can get entangled with them. And uh, well, they're like a bath. So you, uh, you definitely do not do coherent quantum things with circuits with resistors. Um, but the Japanese group, uh, Nakamura and company found a way of making them uh, show some coherence. And the first, Coherence time was around one nanosecond, so just barely enough to see, I would say, but um, in 1999. But um, somehow, because of the great flexibility of this subject, and there were many actors ready to jump in, that the very first jump was by two orders of magnitude. This is uh, quantronium. 
And uh, many groups contributed to further pushing up this coherence time. And uh, so I've stopped this survey here, but the, uh, well, there are a few messages to state here. So the last few brought it up. So by in total, six orders of magnitude. And these were, uh, these are values where definitely these 99% become possible for, for entangling gates, uh, not guaranteed because for example, this crosstalk, this quantum crosstalk that I just mentioned is not a decoherence mechanism. So it's not something you detect by measuring a T2 time of your, of your device. So, uh, but uh, if these coherence uh, effects, these environmental decoherence effects were the only contributor, then you would have passed a sort of threshold for the effective use of, um, of error correction around here. So around uh, the year 2010. So why didn't we very quickly have a uh, million qubit computers? Well, because there are lots of other contributors, unfortunately, to bad fidelity. Um, uh, part of the story, well, one fact about the story is that uh, this has in fact leveled off. So I don't, uh, here's the present on this timeline and uh, the actual further progress on coherence has kind of stalled. Um, and I, uh, in other words, there, there are now reports of experiments that have uh, 500 microsecond coherence times, but that's about it. Um, uh, another important distinction, especially these, many of the early ones were on experiments with only one qubit, uh, but most of the later ones were on things where yes, at least there was one other qubit involved. And um, that is indeed the standard now. That was part of the message that uh, I tell here and I leave this here, even though I, this is a projection I made 10 years ago and I find that I was too pessimistic when I say reproducible, I mean, you know, a coherence time that really was present and usable in a multi-qubit structure. And I thought the progress on that would be rather slow, but it's actually been rather faster. That is, uh, that indeed in multi-qubit devices, we also have good coherence, but we have crosstalk and other problems that uh, get in the way of really effectively using error correction so far. <clears throat> Still, that remains a prime hope in this field. And it feels like we've come tantalizingly close. That is from the perspective of someone who worked indeed in this era, um, you know, and I participated in fact in the physics of, of uh, low temperature electronic devices in this era. So this feels like an incredible new world, you know, to be six orders of magnitude up in coherence, but it's still not sort of quite enough to, uh, to achieve the technologies that we really want. Um, this, um, you know, uh, let's see, I show this, this is an example of a current multi-qubit, uh, device from the Delft, um, uh, group and, uh, but I'm a little out of order here in the sense that I wanted to say just a few things about codes. Uh, but again, but now from the sort of hardware and architecture point of view that, um, if you look at how to use, um, the topological surface code, <clears throat> A fact about it is that you have um, a lot of uh, sort of waste um, in the sense that it's not one qubit equals one, you know, data carrying qubit. That uh, one feature of it to make these codes work, you have to sacrificially measure some qubits constantly, uh, basically as, as frequently as you can manage. And that, that's the dark blue ones in this fabric. Uh, so the messages of, uh, you know, one might write the word Kitaev as the discoverer of this uh, co construct that he uh, showed for us, or he and his and uh, others showed that um, basically 2D layouts of, of qubits are a very good idea for error correction, as opposed to 1D layouts. The 1D layouts are not so effective for error correction. And it has to do with topology, and I won't say anything more about it at the moment. Uh, uh, but that if you if you do use 2D layouts, you have, you will uh, or in all error correction schemes that we have in mind, you will have to be measuring constantly to diagnose errors on the re remainder of the qubits. So you have uh, the white qubits are the ones that remain and um, <clears throat> become entangled. Uh, but uh, then there's again a big overhead in the sense that uh, for uh, reasonable error rates, and by reasonable I mean let's say you were up here. And um, no other errors, no crosstalk or uh, other sort of engineering errors were getting in the way. 
you would still need a whole patch of, of qubits, uh, maybe uh, you know, a thousand qubits uh, just to represent one logical qubit. So that's a very big overhead. And it explains why the Shor algorithm, if you read it through, only involves a few thousand qubits. So why do we say a few million qubits? And it's because of this redundancy that we foresee for quantum error correction. Um, but as I say, foresee, that is that uh, even you know, Google and IBM that's, that have made chips where you could have tried out error correction codes, they're just not high performance enough for that to work effectively. So there's been not much point. They have reported results on repetition codes, on simpler codes, on little fragments of code problems, <clears throat> but no, nothing that really illustrates the power of error correcting codes. And that's in my text, which I've already graffitoed here, that um, the promise of error correction is that you take the effective error rate and you get another 14 orders of magnitude. So um, you get uh, you know, far beyond anything that we expect is reasonable in the physics laboratory. The physicists cannot uh, exclude you know, uh, environmental decoherence by another 14 orders of magnitude. Six orders of magnitude have, have already been uh, miraculous. Uh, so, but, uh, but software promises another 14 orders of magnitude. But so far we haven't even seen one of those 14 orders of magnitude. Oh, but now I can say that this is indeed the effort of uh, Di Carlo, but, and also in Balrov's group, but, um, but <clears throat> where he features explicitly that he has uh, two different sort of species of qubits. They're the A species, which are the ancilla, which are the, uh, the sacrificial qubits. And then the D qubits, which are the data qubits, and this comprises one plaquette of the of the uh, of the Kitayev code. And when we have uh, surface seventeen, that'll comprise what is it, five plaquettes or something of the of the Kitayev code. And um, and uh, I know that these groups hope to publish on those uh, soon, but they have been technically. Uh, uh, hellacious to, uh, to get them to really work. I'll, I'll uh, now feature a little bit of this uh, hellaciousness uh, in the next section, um, uh, which I'm gonna jump mostly to this business of measurement, isolation, amplification, system view. So not much more to say here. Uh, I should say that the, um, the idea that there would have to be layouts like this is not such a new idea that, uh, that I, you can find these sort of uh, wallpaper I design ideas in uh, my paper 12 years ago. Uh, the, the reality has not turned out quite exactly this way. And, uh, but something similar, you know, qubits and resonators in various patterns are gonna be what you see. Um, uh, let me not do those. Okay, now, um, here's part of the other news that says that uh, we need the engineers uh, desperately. Um, so this is, whoops, uh, this, why did that happen? Because, uh, okay, um, this is not so new, uh, but again, it was good because 2012 it was good because it shows a lot of details which are not shown in much recent work, this work in, at, uh, at uh, Delft. And this shows one qubit in a few qubit experiment. But what this features is that the blue box is the quantum stuff. And, uh, but the experimentalist has to worry about the entire diagram. And uh, this <clears throat> is a little bit the story of, you know, why, does, why is there this massive shiny chandelier that everybody uh, on the, all the German television viewers think is a, is a quantum computer that uh, a large part of what they see, of course, they see these sections of different temperatures up to room temperature, but they see many, many cables and uh, we see for loopy cables. And uh, there are these things. So there are uh, microwave cables that go in and out uh, uh, because of the uh, very unautonomous nature of the quantum computer. It has to be constantly told what to do. It has to be constantly told, this is the time to entangle uh, the following two qubits. And that involves sending just the right kind of signal uh, on this line down, literally uh, down into the cryostat from room temperature uh, into the transmon. <clears throat> and then you want to read out uh, the qubits uh, occasionally, at least half of them, as I just showed in the design that I mentioned. 
And when you want to do that, you have to send some signals down a different line and uh, they will uh, go through some complicated hardware, some isolators and circulators, which are very bulky or far bulkier than the, um, than the qubit chip itself. Um, into here, they bounce back again and uh, they uh, go into here, they're amplified, they get bounced back into here, then they go up a different cable, go through an amplification chain. So uh, this involves, uh, so this describes what's going on with uh, most of the physical bulk of what's going on inside this uh, chandelier, this shiny uh, device. Most of it's the cables and the amplifiers and the filters and things that comprise this, because this is one channel. This is what you do for one qubit. Think five million of these. Um, so that's a, a gigantic number of wires. And uh, IBM seriously thinks it will at least up to a thousand do it this way. They'll build in thousands of wires, uh, you know, from the chip out to the rest of the world. Um, uh, the other problem is uh, each of these are instruments that and uh, DiCarlo was kind enough to say exactly what instrument or in some cases data card um, was involved. Uh, each of them is you know, tens of thousands of euros uh, if you just go ahead and buy them. And uh, so that times a million doesn't sound like a very economic proposition. And uh, so I'll give you some quote vision for where that's going, uh, but it's daunting. Uh, 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 so a first step, which has already been taken pretty completely by Google, is to uh, take these, um, you know, manufacturer instruments, which you put into an equipment rack, and um, make them by them make them themselves. Uh, you know, in other words, make figure out what functionality is is uh, needed in that device and make it on one little chip that you, uh, you know, you uh, make out of an, uh, a field programmable gate array, uh, FPGA or something like that. And that is gradually replacing some of these instruments so that the, the instrument rack for the 50, um, 50 qubit experiment, 53 qubit experiment of, of Google is just a few racks and not uh, several rooms full of equipment, which it would have been according to the paradigm of this approach, which is, you know, uh, buy boxes from uh, Agilent and Tektronix that will do all this work. Uh, sorry if this doesn't sound very much like quantum physics, but to me it is. That is, if, if this stuff is going to work, all this other stuff also has to work. And um, this was made pretty explicit. Uh, okay, this is revealing um, uh, from one of the earlier generation Google experiments, not the 53 qubit one, but the nine qubit device, which they spent a lot of time on. They did, uh, if you go deep into their supplementary material, they went to the trouble of showing you their entire wiring structure. Uh, they did it in a much more abbreviated form than DiCarlo did, but it's evident that they did basically have to replicate uh, all this complexity uh, more or less nine times. Um, there is some, uh, quote, multiplexing that's involved already. You can uh, use the same signal wire for multiple measurements, and that uh, allows a sharing, some sharing of, um, of devices. But uh, this is an example also from deep in their uh, supplement of the actual physical waveforms, well, physical electromagnetic waveforms or electric voltage waveforms that are sent onto their transmission lines. Now, I'm not at all going to decode these 23 uh, channels. Um, as you see, there many of them are kind of repetitive, but not really, you know, that they are actually uh, changing what they do uh, uh, from time to time in order to execute an algorithm. Um, <clears throat> I do know enough to see that the, the long tones mean measurement. Uh, uh, and the shorter ones generally mean that you're, you're slightly adjusting some magnetic flux that's changing a property of the circuit, or you're having a little burst of microwave radiation, which is uh, usually energizing some, uh, well, either one or two qubit gate. Um, and I, I believe one could distinguish which ones, but uh, well, we're not going to go to the trouble of diagnosing those, but all that has to work very precisely as a very precise piece of analog hardware um, functioning in a whole system. Now, I have no real solution to this. Uh, 
uh, except the people from spin qubits, remember the double, uh, double uh, well things, uh, say, we're going to get there eventually. And we have some advantages, they say. And uh, one is we can have a way simpler refrigerator. Um, so uh, recall this is, uh, this is all happening at a few millikelvin and that's sort of obligatory for superconductors. I, well, I won't say why, but it's been, uh, there's quite some recent research that says that the, uh, the chip for spin qubits uh, could actually be promoted to the next level of this uh, refrigerator to the like uh, uh, two Kelvin uh, stage, oops, two Kelvin stage of this fridge. That would be a great revolution actually, because uh, basically because uh, heat handling is far easier at those temperatures. Um, it's very hard to make the qubits work reliably there. The environment is far more active at two Kelvin than at 10 uh, milli, milli, milli Kelvin, and uh, that shows itself in the coherence times. So you have to really work to uh, not degrade coherence times by going to these temperatures, but uh, there's some promising uh, results in that direction. Um, now, the other thought is um, a little more speculative, but is connected with that. You already, my, my screen event already jumped to that, but um, the paradigm has been, as I say, to take, you know, 5 million cables and connect them right on to the chip. Um, that's not quite what happens, but uh, there's, um, it's not so different from that. But there's another paradigm that is sort of coming, which is that uh, you will replace these millions of signal lines coming into the refrigerator by like one or two. And because there's only eventually, or finally, there's just some digital information that controls everything and at the moment controls all these microwave boxes. Um, but the, um, the idea is to somewhere in here, you know, at four Kelvin or something to slip in all the electronics, uh, all these things that take 10,000 per box, you reduce it to some, uh, you know, a few micron area on a chip. Um, and there's serious research going on. Actually, you have a splendid department at APFL that is doing exactly this and has perfected putting uh, component parts onto chips and proving that they work at four Kelvin. Um, they dissipate like milliwatts, which is no, a no-go. You cannot dil dis dissipate milliwatts uh, at, um, at, uh, at millikelvin temperatures, but you can possibly dissipate milliwatts, you know, times many channels uh, at these higher temperatures. Okay, so that's, uh, I think I'm gonna wrap up my lecture. I went a little beyond the time I stated. Oh yeah, uh, well, sorry, I meant to really leave a good chunk for discussion, but uh, hopefully this has given you a good to really quote engineering view of where things are. And I think that's where the real developments will be happening in the next few years. So I'll stop there. Um, I know that uh, we're very just close to quote coffee break. I'm of course happy to stay on and do Q and A right until you have your next uh, event but please also go and fill up your, uh, your cups. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for the illuminating lecture, uh, Professor DiVincenzo. And uh, yeah, the floor is open for questions. I see we already have one. So uh, the question is, is there a fundamental limit to the size of superconducting qubits? Could we shrink them further down? Um, the trend has been to uh, blow them up rather than shrink them. And that came from insights of, about the electromagnetics, it turns out uh, that, um, and this, you know, can become part of the engineering understanding, but it's a fairly complicated story that if you have uh, very small um, uh, qubits, it means you have small structures like small capacitors and things like that. Uh, small capacitors means highly concentrated electric fields. So strong electric fields. And unfortunately, strong electric fields, uh, especially AC strong electric fields, tend to shake up the environment. And that does actually bring in some material science, you know, shakes up uh, defects in the environment in two level systems, it makes the dielectrics rather lossy. So the insight was to make, to make really good coherence qubits, it was important to sort of spread them out, make the capacitors kind of big, and the electric fields never have sharp corners and have the electric fields all kind of weak. Um, and so that avoided these, well, really nonlinear effects, but nonlinear uh, loss effects 
Um, so to shrink them back down, it will have to be necessary to really uh, clean up that materials problem. Now that's kind of scary because uh, people have thought off and on for, for 50 years about how to clean up uh, atomic defects in materials and it hasn't been, you know, hasn't worked that well. So um, uh, now I think IBM has acknowledged they're not gonna re-shrink their superconducting qubits and their cartoon of their million qubit thing is to have uh, like meter square chips and about a stack of a thousand of them. That's the cartoon I've seen anyway. So, uh, so miniaturization may not, it's great for your cell phone, but it may not be great for quantum computers. Um, great, thanks. And uh, next, another hardware question. <laughs> what is IBM's approach to handle the number of wires per qubit after the thousand qubit chip? Uh, transduction to a different signal? Um, I don't know, I don't think they've indicated. Um, I guess as the opinion of some of us is that they will eventually have to go digital. As I said, uh, I said, uh, give your, give your uh, quantum computer an IP address was the, uh, was the thing I said. Um, but I haven't heard any sign that they're thinking of doing that. Um, I know they are talking about compact wiring uh, uh, modules. So you have to think of, uh, you know, connectors that, you know, that have a thousand wires and you just go click and it uh, connects in. So very prosaic, uh, you know, things about making wires very packed in. They are not at all packed in now. I mean, there's physical space for way, way more, but, uh, but microwave engineers, analog engineers are very conservative about that, uh, maybe rightly so. So I, the short answer is I don't know uh, that they have any clear answer other than this dream of putting the electronics cold. Well, great. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, presently, so. Um, okay, we relax for a while then. Yeah, exactly, I think we can. Uh, have our coffee break and we'll be back uh, at 11 with Jonathan Holmes' uh, hardware lecture on trapped ions. And once again, I'd like to thank the speaker. Thank you so much, Professor DiVincenzo. Uh, really, really enjoyed your talk. And it's great to see how well uh, these talks start to fit together as we <laughs> have, uh, yeah. Okay, and I'll, uh, I guess I'll send to you uh, an email of this or, uh, or a link to my Dropbox or something of, uh, of this, uh, talk um, slightly cleaned up, but uh, all the graffitos will remain though. Perfect. That sounds great. Okay. All right. Thanks again.
So maybe now, I guess David right, is the only person here. Yeah. Hello, welcome. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. It's weird because I don't see you on the call unless you suddenly appeared. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Should I try sharing my screen then? Yes. Um, uh, but I think I need Francesco to stop sharing. Yes, it looks like he's off on his coffee break, but I can do that. Okay, great. Yeah. You see this on the screen. Hmm? Yes, yeah, so we see your uh, kind of the not the presentation view, but maybe your view with the two. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, 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 I see the opposite one. No, yeah. I have to look at the yeah. hmm? yeah, that's perfect. Uh, somehow the annoying thing about that is it's made all of you guys very small. Uh, ah, here we are. Okay, so everything's working okay? I think so, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So we've been doing questions in the question and answer box. Um, mm -hmm. If it's okay with you, the, the talk is like a total time slot of an hour and 30 minutes. So maybe about halfway through, we can stop and answer some questions or mm -hmm. can... Yeah, that sounds roughly fine to me. I think there'll probably be natural break roughly at that time. So let's see if that works, but um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And I don't see the question and answer, is that right? Or somehow uh, don't you, you can see them or we can read them too, but they're down on the bottom in your panel, the Q&A. Yeah, there's somehow, you know, whenever you share screen, Zoom does all sorts of strange things and hides everything. So it's kind of... Um, okay. Well, uh, we can... We it's can at the top it. now instead of the bottom. Yeah, okay, I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Q&A, I see. Yeah, I think we'll give it another minute and then start. Sure. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> We're sitting up on the top floor of HPF and like absolutely baking in the heat today. <laughs> it's... Uh, okay, yes, yeah. Well, you know, the, um, yeah, I don't think you're allowed to install air conditioning anymore in HPF, but the, um, fortunately, the professor before me, uh, he installed this kind of industrial fridge kind of unit in my office. So I do have this option, but it, I use it rarely and it stinks. So it's not the best thing, but it does save me on some of these really hot days. Yeah. So, yeah. Right, right. All right, so we have to get creative here. Let's... Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, I think uh, we can get started then. So I'm um, really excited to uh, introduce the next lecturer to talk uh, about trapped ion qubits. We're lucky to have Professor Jonathan Holm, uh, who did his uh, PhD at Oxford finished in 2006 and then did a postdoc at uh, NIST in Boulder, Colorado. 
And then in uh, 2010, I believe, uh, came to uh, start a group as a professor at ETH Zurich, where he remains today. Uh, and with that, I think you can take it away, Professor Hall. Cool. Okay. Thanks very much. And thanks for having me here to talk. Uh, and I hope you guys enjoy the next hour and a half or so of uh, discussions. And I hope uh, also that you do raise questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Hopefully somebody is managing them, though I'll try and keep my eyes open uh, and uh, keep things active, because of course this is a workshop, not really just a, a lecture as such. So indeed, uh, I will talk about the main business of my research, in fact, which is to, uh, trying to implement quantum computing with uh, trapped ions. So what you see in this picture here, and I hope you can see my cursor, uh, is a, a circuit board like structure right with a gold chip on it there are a bunch actually of little wire bonds connecting the gold chip to the circuit board uh, and the gold chip essentially is has a number of electrodes on it and we apply voltages to those electrodes and what that allows us to do is to trap charged atoms uh, a few tens of microns above the surface of this chip uh, and you see a string of these charged atoms here. So each of these dots that you see here is the fact that we've got a laser, which uh, is- um, Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, your cursor is not showing up. Uh, it's not showing up uh, because it's on the wrong, I'm looking at the wrong screen. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah good. Um, so each of these uh, dots that you see here then is uh, a single atom. And it's appearing to you because we're, uh, we're shining a laser on these atoms and the laser resonantly excites them and then the atoms decay and they emit light. And that's why you're seeing individual dots. And I think what you should take home from that is that these are actually all sitting in a common potential. So we've made a, a bowl for these atoms, if you like, but they're charged atoms, so they repel each other. And so that's why they sit uh, at optically resolvable positions in space. They're separated by uh, a few microns or so each of these atoms. So the basic notion then is that we have to get electrical signals onto these chips that allows us to trap atoms, but I'll have to tell you a bit more about how that works. The other aspect to this in the context of quantum information, and you already see it there, is that we're using lasers to control these atoms, uh, and in this case, produce fluorescence. And in fact, this chip is rather unique, and that's something I'll come to later on in the talk, uh, in that what you see on the right hand side is actually a bundle of uh, optical fibers which are delivering light to these uh, atoms in the chip actually not these atoms but the ones we actually trap on those chips and uh, that's a fairly new feature so one of the challenges in trying to scale up quantum computing with ions is how to deliver light efficiently uh, and this approach of coupling with a bundle of fibers into the actual trip structure is a new approach to doing that which i'll show you uh, towards the end of the talk Okay, I try and advance my slides. So um, you've just been having an introduction to quantum information from uh, David, and I'm sure you've had uh, other talks already, and for instance, from Andreas yesterday about quantum bits and quantum logic gates. So um, I like to sort of uh, think of the whole problem as being that you would like to make for a computer, you would like to break things down into simple sets of operations acting on simple systems. And the simple systems are, of course, our qubit systems, which in our case, or in my case, are the single trapped atoms. And then what we have to realize is things looking like uh, this circuit. And what we see uh, in, so what we start with, if you like, is that each of these atoms is a single qubit. And then we have these circuits with timelines. And there are different types of operations we have to do, but some of them happen to individual atoms, and other of them typically happen to pairs of atoms, or maybe in this case, they connect three of these atoms together. So those are things we're going to, I'm going to have to teach you how we do uh, in the trapped iron context. Just notice that uh, though I drew one of the sets of uh, interactions, it's not necessarily true that always these uh, connections are between neighboring atoms, right? So in addition to being able to do things fairly locally between neighbors, uh, we also have to make long distance connections in order to do uh, sort of arbitrary circuits in these quantum computing architectures. And then at the end of some circuit, you might need to measure. So I have to describe to you how we're going to measure these qubits. So I just wanted to comment on the status of quantum computing generally. And uh, what I've displayed in that previous slide was a sort of network of around nine qubits uh, where there were a number of gates being applied. 
Uh, and in a certain sense, uh, this sort of try and realize a set of uh, a circuit on a certain set of qubits is the game that's going on today in what I would call is noisy intermediate scale quantum uh, computing. So the deal there is that you treat every single physical system as if it's your qubit for storing information and you try and make the largest circuits that you can make and you see uh, is that powerful enough to produce some sort of quantum computational advantage, right? So um, the problem with that uh, is that it'll be limited, I think, in the number of qubits that can be used in a useful way. And the primary thing is it's limited by uh, the errors that you have in your operation. So I think today, probably in most technologies, it's not the number of qubits you can collect together as such that limits you, but it's the amount of error that happens on every single operation that you perform. So in this sort of regime, then if you can produce lower errors, then it's basically possible to control more qubits for a longer amount of time for more operations, and you get more power to your quantum computer and such. So just an example of that, there was a recent IBM experiment with a 27 qubit chip, but the evaluation of performance that sort of got them to their limits in what they call quantum volume was actually performed on around seven qubits, uh, and they were already limited at that sort of level. So this is not the end game of a quantum computer. If, if we're always limited by errors, and these errors actually scale pretty badly with number of qubits and number of operations, uh, then we're probably stuck to doing things which we hope might be useful, but we have no guarantee that we will be able to do anything useful. So where people know uh, algorithms that certainly look like they should be useful are, are for reliable quantum computers. And those I would call fault tolerance. And the challenge of those is something I'll come back to later on, it's to do perform quantum error correction. But what you end up with is actually much larger numbers of qubits. Uh, so for instance, I think people think that you'll need many more than 100,000 uh, connected qubits, which can then be used to perform error correction and do uh, give reliable results in uh, algorithms. So error is also an important thing for fault tolerant computers because they only really become possible if your errors are less than some particular value, which we typically consider a threshold, yeah? So in the context of quantum error correction, actually, lower error means um, A, that the thing can, is actually possible at some threshold, but the other thing it means is that you can make a smaller and faster computer, yeah? And just to give you an idea, I think most people typically think that errors, and primarily this is on two qubit gates that's important, would need to be below about one part in 10 to the four. Uh, that's the sort of probability of error, if you like, uh, in order to make quantum computers work at a reasonable size and reasonable speed. So that's the context in which we have to examine all the operations that I'm going to tell you about that we perform on trapped ions. That's the sort of background. So we're always trying to see how can we attain these very uh, high levels of uh, operational uh, quality. So the first up thing that you need in that case then is to have uh, qubits that are very well isolated and for which the memory is much longer than the um, lifetime of it or the time taken to perform any operations, right? And the tool of ion trap physics, and this is a much older example than the one I showed you originally, uh, is basically to take metal electrodes uh, and either to apply static or apply a combination of static uh, potentials and also oscillating potentials to these uh, electrodes. So I'll tell you more about how that's done in a moment and why it is that we need this oscillating uh, potential. But just to say that this is an example of a trap built in probably the 1990s, but actually still in operation remarkably successfully today in Rainer Blatt's group uh, in Innsbruck. Uh, and there's been an evolution as we think about scaling to more complex systems towards making traps that are smaller and have many more uh, connections and can provide some modularity towards things that can be made in standard uh, microfabrication processes to enable higher complexity. And of course, coming with that is additional electronics and packaging that is, is part of the uh, challenge of building uh, bigger systems. So you'll find that ion traps are operated both at room temperature and at four Kelvin. And the primary reason for that, I would say, is just about achieving extremely high vacuum. 
And the reason for that is that what we want for qubits is that they're extremely well isolated from the outside world and that we don't lose them. And, and collision with a background gas uh, atom is one way in which you can actually lose ions from these traps, which otherwise remain here for very long periods of time. In a trap such as this one here, you could expect to trap ions for months yeah, and not have a loss. Okay, so why is it that we need this radio frequency potential? You could think to yourself, well, if I apply static electric fields, I should be able to uh, confine a charge. But in fact, that's not true, and it's not true because of Laplace's equation. So what does Laplace's equation tell you? It tells you that the sums of the curvatures of the potential in three different directions have to be equal to zero. And that means if you make a potential well in two directions, you for sure have a potential hill in the other direction. And so if you stick a charge at the center of this trap, it'll just fall out down the hill. Yeah. So how can we uh, solve this problem? Uh, the way that's done in what's called a pull trap, and all those examples that I showed you until now were pull traps, is to use something called a ponderomotive potential. So two of the terms of the potential are modulated at some frequency uh, omega, right? What does that mean? It means that this well and this well are periodically turning from hill to, to well to hill to well, right, in both of these dimensions. And so we can think about what the forces are on the uh, atom if we sit at some position in the well. And basically what it's going to feel is an electric field at that position, right? So the force is some sort of oscillating electric field, at least away from the trap center. So we can look at the energy, the kinetic energy associated with the driving from that electric field. This is gonna jiggle the atom back and forth together. And what we do is we average that over a cycle of the oscillation. And why do we do that? Well, we say that the, this driving frequency is high enough that the ion really just gets wiggled backwards and forwards and doesn't leave the trap within one single cycle. So then we average the energy over a cycle of oscillation and we find that it's proportional to the electric field squared. So what does that mean? You've got some effective energy, a ponderomotive potential, which if I'm sitting at a high electric field, which I would get far up the potential well, will be a high potential. And if I'm sitting at the bottom of where there's no electric field, I should get zero potential. So now in both of these directions here, I get a confining potential which is this ponderomotive type of potential due to this jiggling motion of the atoms. So that's not the only way to trap ions. So I'll come back later to the notion of a penning trap, which is actually that instead of using any oscillating fields, one adds a homogeneous magnetic field. Uh, and that's got a slightly different uh, way of uh, operating. As I say, I'll mention it later, but it's just to give you a complete picture. This is not the only way to trap charges. So these are extremely well isolated systems. As I say, you can trap ions for, for months at a time. Uh, and that had an application before uh, quantum computing, if you like. And that was in uh, frequency standards or atomic clocks. So that is that we, if we have atoms that are extremely well uh, isolated and, and cooled, and indeed you can laser cool atoms to millikelvin temperatures, you've got an extremely stable environment for the atom. It's almost extremely well isolated from anything else, so it's an extremely stable system. And that's where uh, the way that atomic clocks use that is to perform what's called Ramsey experiments, right? So they start with an atom that's in a single eigenstate, and then by resonantly driving with a laser, create a superposition of two of the internal states of this uh, atom. Then after a waiting time, what's going to happen is because there's an energy difference between those two states, a phase difference will be picked up. And finally, what we want to do is to interrogate that by combining the two parts of the superposition. And how is that done? That's done by another pulse coming from the same uh, laser that was used to excite initially. So what does that provide us with? That provides us a probability when we measure this particle uh, which depends in a sinusoidal way on the difference between the laser frequency and the atomic frequency. So what's useful about that? Well, the atomic, the laser frequency is an oscillator that can be running along, yeah? And what we want is, uh, what the problem with such an oscillator is that it might come from a laser which heats up or cools down or changes in some way. And this frequency here is not stable. 
So how is the atom used? Well, the atom is extremely well isolated. Atoms everywhere are identical and you can stabilize their environment. And so you reference, does this uh, unstable oscillator run at the same frequency as this atom that has a very well-defined frequency? And this is how the cesium clocks that are up in satellites and things uh, also work, right? So the advantage uh, and the reason this got done for the first time uh, or came to the trapped iron field, if you like, was the possibility to make these oscillators not just be microwaves, but also be laser oscillators, which are much higher frequency. And what that allows you to do is to make clocks with extremely good uh, fractional uh, frequency stability or, or uncertainty. So these values, uh, systematic uncertainty here, the, the degree to which the frequency of this oscillator is known, uh, is below 10 to the minus uh, 18. That's really a remarkable number at the state of the art uh, today. And ultimately what this is, is a, it's a qubit of some sort, right? Uh, here is a two level system, which is being left alone in time. And there's some sort of control oscillator, which is being referenced to it. And the limit in the amount of coherence you would actually get from this qubit is given by the oscillator itself, typically. This thing is unstable. And so it's your control that's bad rather than the atom itself. In the microwave domain, uh, that can also be done. So here's data from Nylav working with a microwave qubit. Uh, and the thing to see there is that without much effort actually in this case, uh, we can see coherence times that are several hundred milliseconds. And in fact, we've seen several seconds. And that compares to the operation times in trapped ions, which I'll tell you about in a moment, which is sort of on the level of a few tens of microseconds, right? So there's a very large ratio there then between the time it takes to do a gate and the time it takes for your qubit to decode here, which is sort of also what's being used at some level by the atomic clock systems. So in a sense, before even qubits came along, uh, trapped ions were already being considered as single qubit systems uh, for uh, atomic clocks. So let me say a little bit more about the choices uh, people make of storing information in atoms. So I'll show you now uh, atomic structure. So this is actually uh, a calcium atom. And these are the lowest energy levels uh, of the outermost electron in the calcium atom, right? So they're labeled by various uh, quantum numbers. So this would tell me that uh, the big letter here tells me the amount of orbital angular momentum. Uh, the subscript tells me the total angular momentum. And these are all fine structure levels in one of the n, uh, n's, or you know, the principal quantum number, I think here is four and here is three. Yeah? And these are all different, uh, sorry, they're all differing in energy by optical frequency transitions. But one nice thing is that there are selection rules here. So there's actually an excited state here, which because you would need to change the total angular momentum by two, doesn't have a dipole allowed decay. And that means the lifetime of this level here is around a second. That's a, a good starting point because as I said, gate operations take tens of microseconds. So then you can think to yourself, well, I could use one level here and one level here as my qubit. And then what do I need? I need a stable reference oscillator to control this qubit, which I get from a laser, which has to be a narrow line width laser with sort of a few Hertz line width that resonantly drives this uh, transition. That we would call an optical qubit because it's controlled direct resonantly by optical frequency uh, oscillators. But another one that we use in my lab is beryllium ions. Uh, and in beryllium, there's no none of these long lived states that exist. In fact, what I'm showing here again is the S one half state that's similar to what we had in calcium, but I don't you don't see any D states at all. You just see a P one half and a P three half excited state. And there's no selection rule helping you here. These are fast or short-lived states that decay rapidly into the ground state. But beryllium also has a non-zero nuclear spin. So it actually has a number of levels in its ground state. And these are all separated by around a gigahertz. And what that means is that they just don't decay on any time scale that's relevant, right? So the lifetime of these states is, is years, I think it, almost unmeasurable because it's so long, yeah? So in that sense, uh, for these systems isolated in vacuum, uh, T1 decay uh, is here an issue at the one second level, and here is just doesn't uh, occur in the consideration of the problem. Okay, so there's not really a T1 in the hyperfine qubits. We call these hyperfine because this is about hyperfine structure of the atom. 
These have to be controlled in slightly different way because the frequency difference between states is somewhat different, right? It's, a, it's on the level of a gigahertz. So either microwaves can be used or another common approach is to use Raman transitions. So this is, uh, we use light, but far detuned from any transition in the atom to drive a two photon process that drives us between these two states. So I just wanted to point out one feature which is very different from solid state qubits, which occurs for these atomic systems. And that is that the qubits are uh, identical to each other, right? Two atoms are, are identical. Uh, and that provides a useful protection for noise in some, from noise in some situations. And I, let me share that with you. So the basic notion is the following. Uh, here I have two qubits uh, and uh, you can think of them having two levels, zero and one and they've got an energy difference between the two. And what we see here is that um, we have here a frequency uh, and I've given it a time dependence, which is that you can imagine there's some noise source in the laboratory, which in our case would be magnetic field noise, which changes the energy between these two states. Uh, and on this qubit, I give it a certain uh, function, omega primed, right? Which is different to what is uh, present on this qubit here. So uh, we can think what happens uh, if this fluctuates. What we'll see, uh, let me just go back, uh, is that the coherence between these two, if this is a random process with noise, the coherence between these two will decay and that will limit my phase coherence of my system. But now one thing it's worth considering is what happens if you have uh, an entangled state, which is not no longer a superposition of zero, just zero and one, but it is made of a superposition of the zero one state where zero comes from here and one comes from here and the one zero state, which has a one from the left qubit and a zero from the right. Yeah. Then uh, we can write the time evolution. It just comes from what we had above, but we can pull out the common factor of uh, one of the time evolutions. And what we see is that we have a superposition where the phase coherence now depends on the difference between the noise at the two uh, locations, right? And so if we are able to make qubits which are fairly close together to what compared to sources of noise. And for instance, in my laboratory, most of the sources of noise are magnetic fields coming from current somewhere in the lab, but they're meters, you know, on the order of meters away from the experiment. And my ions sit a few microns apart, then the noise is very much common mode. And, and this sort of noise will then, uh, or this behavior will then reject essentially any common no mode source of noise. So, that's a nice feature. Uh, it means that entangled states can actually have much longer coherence times than the bare qubits themselves. So here's an experiment from Innsbruck from the mid 2005s where uh, they're just looking at the quality with which they make such an entangled state and how it lives over a delay time. And what you see is that this state lives rather well all the way out to 20 seconds or so. And actually the bare qubit coherence in that system was probably a few milliseconds, right? So the symmetry can be a very powerful thing in rejecting key sources of noise and producing extremely good coherence times. It comes as with any other error rejection or correction approach with overhead, you have to do operations on a multi-qubit system rather than on single qubit system. But nevertheless, in the future, this is one way of doing a sort of lowest level encoding in trap ions, which comes from the fact that these qubits are identical. So uh, we've considered now the systems and now we have to figure out how we're going to perform uh, detection of these qubits, right? So I'm gonna just consider the case of calcium for simplicity. And as I said, the qubit there is defined on this uh, optical transition with a very long lifetime. Now the challenge in detection is what we want to do is we want to find out are we in the zero state or are we in the one state, right? And there actually we make use of another feature, which is that there are other levels present. In particular, this one here has a very short lifetime. So what that means is that if we turn on a laser uh, at 397 nanometers, and we actually have to put an additional one at the same time, then we excite this atom into the excited state from which it rapidly decays. And when it rapidly decays, it emits a photon which comes in a random direction, yeah? And if we're, if we're good about things, we can collect as many of those emitted photons as possible. And actually the second nice feature is that this decay came to the same state where it started. So what that means is that the laser will just re-excite it again uh, and we get cycles of excitation and emission. And if we started in that state, then counting over those cycles, we get lots of photons spat out uh, and we see that we would see a bright ion. 
If we're in this state here, we're not coupled to these lasers. Yeah. So we would turn the 729 laser off while doing this and we wouldn't see anything essentially. So if the signal says it's dark, then you find you're in the one state. If it's zero, you find you're in the bright state. So what does that really look like? Here I'm actually plotting the sum of a bunch of, uh, of the number of photons detected on a detector uh, for performing in such an experiment uh, in many repeats. In fact, I think here it was repeated many million times, okay? And in this case here, the superpositions we were working with meant that you get about two thirds of the time you would find your system in the zero state and one third you find them in the one state. Now, what do you see? You see a sum of two Poisson distributions, right? One, which is given by this dashed line is when the ion started in the bright state. And that's the number of photons we would expect to get uh, and the number of times we would expect to get that out of the total number of repeats. If we're in the dark state, we expect to get a different distribution, which is a part Poisson distribution, but with a tail coming in here due to the finite lifetime actually of this state. And just notice I'm plotting this on a logarithmic scale. So there's actually quite a contrast between this point here and, and the peaks. So by setting a threshold here, what we say is that if we get more than this threshold number of counts, we will assume that the ion started in the bright state if we get less, we'll assume that it started in the dark state, yeah? And we'll make a mistake some of the time because these two histograms overlap each other, but we don't make that mistake so often. So the overlap is actually extremely small such that the probability of error here is on this level of uh, part in 10 to the minus four. It's a couple in this case, uh, which we were looking to achieve in order to get a quantum error correction to work. So then we have to perform gates. As I said before, uh, this happens uh, in our optical qubits just by resonantly driving uh, the transition between the qubit states. And basically what happens is we have an ion sitting in a trap somewhere and we pulse on light for a fixed duration. Uh, and over that fixed duration, the system is resonantly evolving under, under a two level Hamiltonian and we get Rabi oscillations. So if we start in the zero state, we would see that our probability to be in that uh, in the other state, the one state over time uh, exhibits this nice oscillatory behavior. And you see here that the time scale is on the order of a few microseconds and uh, people have worked with gates anywhere down to tens of nanoseconds and, and some people will work slower than this. Yeah. So by varying the length of the pulse, we get different rotations, yeah. Again, and this is just a benchmark coming from our system a few years ago was that the errors here are on the level of a couple of parts per uh, in 10,000. So this is again on the order that we want to be on in order to do quantum computing. And just to say that's not the record by any means. So the, the using microwaves in Oxford, they were able to achieve error rates on the level of one part in a million. Yeah, so uh, in a sense, these things can be uh, certainly adequately controlled for the purposes uh, of these single qubit gates. So, but we should remember, and that's going to be key to doing two qubit gates or multi-qubit gates is that we actually don't just have internal states of this atom that are electronic states, but also we have trapped particles and trapped particles, they can oscillate about their equilibrium position. And if you think about a laser uh, coming in to hit uh, a particle, it's a wave coming in to hit a particle. And if this particle moves backwards and forwards in that laser beam, it essentially phase modulates the light from the laser beam, yeah? And if you phase modulate a signal, you get uh, sidebands typically, yeah? And indeed, that's exactly what happens uh, in the trapped ion system. So there's uh, internal states, but then an ion can oscillate in three directions. And so there are three essentially independent harmonic oscillators per ion. And these are coupled together. And the way they're coupled together is that the laser can transfer momentum uh, to and from the center of mass of the ion, which is the oscillators, if you like, uh, in driving transitions uh, between internal states. So we can look at a spectrum uh, as we sweep the laser frequency across the two level system. Uh, and if we're in the middle here, that's where we see these Rabi oscillations that just affect the internal state of the atom. But what you also see is that you see pairs of peaks on either side. And these are these modulation sidebands, which are about the fact that the ion is oscillating. Uh, it has emotional oscillation in the laser field. 
So in a sense, what this is, I, I just give you a sense of the, the frequency scale. So internal states in an optical transition are separated by 400 and so uh, terahertz, right? The motion here is usually around a megahertz or so. And so the laser is providing basically a parametric drive, which resonantly connects these two very different frequency scales also, uh, and allows you to still make resonant processes uh, that involve both at the same time. So I think I was going to build up. Yeah, so, sorry. Ah, keynote is weird about advances, yeah. Um, so what you see here is that I've written some slightly different uh, Hamiltonians on these other peaks. And these are essentially the resonant Hamiltonians we would get if we tuned the laser to this frequency. But let me talk you through them a little bit one by one. So here we have the same spectrum. And the way I'm drawing this energy level diagram here is that we have the, the qubit, which I've actually drawn as a spin in this sense, uh, which I, the three levels on the top correspond to spin up, the three levels on the bottom to spin down. And the harmonic oscillator levels I plot along the horizontal scale. So I plot the lowest harmonic oscillator levels here. So what do we see? We see that if we drive resonantly with the qubit transition, we won't change the harmonic oscillator level. We'll just directly resonantly drive these vertical transitions here. But if we tune our laser below resonance by some amount, which is exactly the frequency of the oscillator, we'll find that we don't just excite the qubit state, but we also change the motional state simultaneously, right? And in fact, that's uh, equivalent to a James Cummings Hamiltonian. We call it driving the red sideband, where you destroy quanta if you excite the spin uh, and vice versa. But, and this is the nice thing in trapped ions is that you're not stuck with just a James Cummings Hamiltonian, but you can tune your laser also uh, to the blue sideband. And if you do that, then when you excite a spin, you have to add quanta to the motion, right? Uh, and so there we get a counterpart term, which has got creation operators coupled to uh, a sigma plus operator, right? So in a sense, what you're able to do with trapped ions is by tuning the laser for different pulses to different frequencies, you can produce different Hamiltonians that you desire, yeah. Okay, a couple of questions and people are asking about these spectra. So Ivan uh, Roykov is asking, what are the small peaks between the red blue sidebands and the carrier frequency? Yeah, so well observed. Uh, these little peaks here uh, are actually, I think in this case, you would see that the distance of them from the center here is the same as the difference between these two frequencies here. So actually they correspond to a higher order process, which would involve, I think, creating so first, what are these resonances? Remember the ion has three directions that it can oscillate, right? So it'll have three different oscillators. And for each of them, depending on the frequency I use for the laser, I can produce these Hamiltonians with the relevant creation operator for any of these uh, different modes of oscillation. And then this guy here is a higher order process. Actually, I think the Hamiltonian here would be something that looks like um, a creation operator on this mode a destruction operator on this mode, and then a sigma plus uh, operator, yeah? So it's a nonlinear Hamiltonian, if you like, at that point. So I think that answers Rudy's uh, question as well. So this resonance here is another mode of motion that I didn't choose to point at, yeah. Okay, Anya asks, is the calcium atom qubit more like reliable than the hyperfine qubit? Or why stick to the calcium one if the hyperfine qubit has far longer lifetimes? Yeah, so that's a bit of a technical issue. Um, the so the calcium, yeah, the calcium optical qubit in a sense, the two qubit gates can be done by a single direction of laser beams with just two frequencies on them, and that's somewhat of a uh, and it's a laser which is at um, a red wavelength, seven twenty nine nanometers. Uh, and what that means is it's an easier laser to produce and, and to think about doing things like integrating it into complex optical structures. And in our hyperfine qubits, then you tend to find you have to use ultraviolet wavelengths. And at the moment, the, those are harder to integrate into uh, any, um, into sort of uh, integrated optic structures, which I'll see later. And so I chose calcium because I had the viewpoint that I wanted to be able to use um, more advanced optical control. And that's really mostly available at longer wavelengths today. Yeah. 
So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, well, it got dismissed at least. Yeah. Okay, so how do you, uh, let me keep going with these questions. How do you maintain a few Hertz line width with absolute frequency of the iron? What locking method do you use? Essentially the deal is that you can buy um, pieces of glass, uh, which, we, which you can stick a hole in and stick mirrors on the end of, which are extremely stable in length. And so what we have is our laser is uh, stabilized to the length of uh, an optical cavity made around one of these ULE uh, chunks of glass, if you like. And there, I think the drift rates are, there's a sort of residual drift, but that's slow compared to the time scale of doing experiments. And so we recalibrate the frequency of the laser to the iron periodically. That's basically what's going on in an atomic clock. Um, but um, the piece of glass gives the sort of short-term stability of the laser. And we use a pound driver hall lock, if that's interesting. Good, so let me then go back. These are the primary Hamiltonians that we make uh, in uh, trapped ions. And one of the starting points is actually to pro provide um, low temperatures. And in fact, one of the key steps in the mid nineties that sort of prepared the ground for quantum computing with trapped ions was to cool to the ground state. So there the basic idea is that we use this red sideband transition. This is this Jane's Cummings Hamiltonian. And if we do that, then that resonantly drives Rabi oscillations, uh, which uh, as we excite the spin, they subtract emotional quanta. But this is a reversible process, right? It's just a Hamiltonian. So no good for, for reducing cooling. Uh, for cooling, what we do is we add something unidirectional, which is dissipation. And in this case, the dissipation is between the two internal states of the atom. So it makes one decay to the other. Uh, and as I told you earlier that lifetimes were very long, the way we do this is by adding an additional laser actually, which repumps the, the, the atom, okay? And if we do this, you can see the unidirectional nature means that if I end up, if I come get excited to this state here, I'll decay here, I'll then get excited up to here, decay here, et cetera, et cetera, until I finish up in the state that's not coupled to this Hamiltonian, which is the ground state, yeah? So in calcium, that's done with, a, as I said, with this 854 nanometer laser, which excites into a short-lived state, and then that decays. So you see the effect of that here. This is actually the time that the cooling is applied for. And I'm plotting on this side the probability of excitation for a, a separate pulse that's done on this uh, Hamiltonian here that's trying to subtract quanta, right? So just notice that when you get to the ground state, you can't subtract any quanta, right? So you won't be able to excite the system. And that, at that point, the probability being down will remain uh, one, yeah? But before you perform the cooling, the probability to remain down for this probe pulse was not one. And that's because you could still excite the system. That means you are basically in these higher excited states. And if I plot that in phase space, that's a, a Gaussian sitting at the center of a, a position momentum uh, phase space. Yeah. Okay, so there's an addition to that that's used for the two qubit gates. Uh, and um, the, I'll come to your question in a moment, Marcel. Yeah. So the, the idea there is not just to use a single frequency of laser. Okay, so what you see here is that I take that same spectrum, but I imagine that I drive both sidebands, both the red sideband and the blue sideband at the same time. And then I get an interesting Hamiltonian in the sense that it's one that's proportional to the sum of A and A dagger. Uh, which is, if you like, the position of an oscillator, right? Uh, but it's got a dependence on the internal state of the ion. This is the uh, X operator on the internal states, the spin states of the atom. So this is essentially a Hamiltonian that's proportional to position, right? Uh, and uh, what that means is that we've got a force because the force is an energy that's proportional to position, but this force depends on the internal state of the ion, yeah? So if I look at the unitary when this force is resonant, what I get is that I displace my oscillator, I excite the oscillator, but the direction in which I displace it is proportional to which eigenstate of sigma x that I'm in. So uh, one way that gets used is to make uh, get what get called Schrodinger cat state. So let me quickly describe what that is. So if you start with the spin up, then it's actually in a superposition of two X eigenstates, right? You can describe this as a superposition just by resolving into the other bases. And then if I apply a force now that's proportional 
uh, whether sine of the force is proportional to which of these eigenstates you're in, then if I started with an atom that's at a single point in space, let's say it's at the origin, then what I'm gonna find is that I push uh, the two states apart uh, in a way which is dependent on the internal state. So I've sort of pr produced a, a arrow to the left, arrow to the right, if you like, uh, which is representing the spin, and they get displaced to two different locations. In fact, for, because this is an oscillator, they don't just get displaced. What happens is that they start to oscillate when you force an oscillator resonantly. And the, uh, as you go on in time, they, the oscillation amplitude gets larger and larger and larger. Yeah. So actually, this is an entangled state. It entangles the internal state of the atom with a displaced copy of the atom in its uh, center of mass motion, if you like. Uh, and that's was considered back in the 1990s as somehow sort of Schrodinger's cat because, well, the amplitude of this oscillation can become macroscopic, right? And if it becomes macroscopic, you sort of have a, a macroscopic degree of freedom in the sense that there could be large oscillations going on here, which is entangled with a microscopic system. So that's sort of got this analogy to a dead and alive cat. Of course, the iron itself is not a macroscopic thing, right? So that's a subtlety. Uh, but rather it can be exploring macroscopic quantities. Yeah? And that's the nature of this being a Schrodinger cat. So these sort of states have been of interest for quite a while. We were playing with them a number of years ago. And actually in the last few years, we generalized this to using superpositions, not just of two states, but of three. And actually we also squeezed these states. So here actually again is position uh, and momentum. And what you see is that when you superpose three squeeze states, uh, you get, this is a, what I would call a quasi probability distribution, right? So these peaks tell you these are places where, uh, where you have a combination of a position and a momentum where you might expect to find the atom, yeah? Uh, except this being a Wigner function, there are places where you have negative quasi probability. That's the sense in which it's not a joint probability as such, yeah? But these states here actually can be used to encode qubits in their own right in an error correction code. Uh, and just to give you some recent results from that, then we were able to perform error correction uh, on such a system, which is just a single oscillator really. And you see here uh, Pauli observables as a function of time and the dashed and this group of curves here is all coming from having no correction on. Uh, but with the error correction, you see we can extend the coherence of these qubits. And this is one of the first demonstrations where real extension of coherence has been, of a logical qubit has been achieved. So that's a bit of an aside. It's not strictly related to most of the qubit work we do in quantum computing, but I think it's relevant because it's error correction. Okay, Marcel Meyer had a question, which is how much is the laser cooling counteracted by the motion caused by the RF trapping field? Yeah, that's a good question. So the RF trapping field provides this oscillatory modulation as well, right? So that what that means is if you're away from the center of the trap, then your ion is being driven backwards and forwards. And what it does is it provides an additional modulation of the phase of the laser beam. So what you would find is that you don't just get these um, sidebands due to the sort of standard harmonic oscillator motion, but you also get sidebands due to the additional driven motion, but they're at much higher frequencies typically. Yeah, so to, to, we don't tend to consider them. And this motion here, the, the atom is always in phase with the driving field at some level uh, in, the, in the case of the, uh, what we call the micro motion at this RF frequency. So it's not in a certain sense, a quantum harmonic oscillator motion. It's, it's more of a, just a, a driven modulation of the system. So we tend to try and minimize it because it leads to better stability of the system, uh, but otherwise it doesn't tend to affect our control. Good, so with the tool of these state dependent forces, which were heavily used in uh, the work I'm showing here, then let's go to consider what happens for a, a multi-qubit uh, gate. So um, for quantum computing and the most sort of advanced in terms of qubit number approach to building quantum computers on trapped ions, is really to have a, a long string of ions. So here is actually uh, a picture coming from Rainer Blatt's group in Innsbruck, where we've got 50 ions all in a chain. And the basic notion of doing quantum computing in such a, a chain of ions is that if one of the ions moves, then the Coulomb repulsion pushes all of the other ions. This is a semi-rigid object, if you like. There's Coulomb repulsion between all of the ions and the whole chain will move. Yeah? 
So the idea here then is to use lasers to provide these forces. Uh, and remember the forces are dependent on the internal states of the ion, so that's the qubit state. And if you want to do a gate between these two ions, well, you would shine on laser light with these two frequencies, if you like, on this ion here and on this ion here. Now, what does that do? It provides forces which depend on the internal state. And these forces, if the internal states are the same, will be correlated forces. And if the internal states are different, they will be anti-correlated. They'll be opposite forces, right? So the key thing is then that the internal state tells you what the force would like to do to the chain, right? If the internal states are opposite, you would expect that they want to push these ions together. If the internal states are the same, they'll push the ions in phase with each other. So you can think about any two ions here being basically connected by a little spring. So now what happens, okay, if we have a correlated state, then the two ions fill the same phase, right? So if we have one, one uh, in our system or a zero, zero, then we're not going to excite the spring because the spring uh, isn't, would be excited by out of phase motion of these two ions, right? So in that case, if you don't excite the spring, then basically nothing happens, right? In the other case, then we have an anti-correlated state. We have opposite states here, either one or zero. And now the forces are felt opposite to each other and that will excite this springy motion, yeah? And because there's some motion and then there's some energy in the motion for a reason which I'll explain in just a moment, uh, then what happens is that uh, we can arrange things so that the excitation uh, is transient. So it starts by exciting motion and then the excitation goes away again. And the nice thing about that quantum mechanically is that uh, it leaves behind a trace. It leaves it behind a trace, which is a phase factor, yeah? So with this in hand, then, this difference between not exciting the spring or exciting the spring, when we can organize that two of the internal state combinations will pick up a phase, which can be chosen to be I, if you like, and the other two will not, right? And that is actually equivalent operation to a C naught gate, as long as you can do single qubit operations. So let me give you a bit more information about the mystery of how this phase uh, arises, right? The physics, which I told you about so far for Schrodinger cat states was a resonant forcing of an oscillator, right? So there you can imagine you've got an oscillator that's stationary and you drive with a force. Here I give the force in red, yeah? And the resulting motion is that the atom gradually absorbs this energy uh, and it, its amplitude of motion increases and increases and increases, yeah? So what happens if you take a detuned force? Well, what happens is initially you put in motion into the atom, but at some point later, actually, the uh, atom is out of phase with the force that you're continuing to drive with, right? So the, the motion you've put into the atom oscillates, but it gets out of phase with the force. And at that point, the force will start to take energy back out of the system again. And eventually it'll take out all the energy that it put in. And at some time later, you're, you've removed, there's no more motion, yeah? So if we think about that, uh, and there's a certain time scale associated that, which is to do with the detuning means. So if we look at that evolution, that's a classical evolution that I've described to you. And if I looked at that in the unitary that I would write down for a gate or a quantum mechanical unitary for a time dependent Hamiltonian, that if you like is all covered by the first term, the direct integral of your Hamiltonian. But in quantum mechanics, you have to worry about ordering of operators if they're time dependent, and this leads to additional terms. Uh, and it's these additional terms which are critical to realizing some sort of phase. And if I wanted to describe that in a, a phase space, so again, a sort of position momentum like phase space, what happens when I do a detuned drive is I actually excite the system from the origin away from the origin, but I take a circular trajectory. I go to a maximum excitation, that's when I'm furthest from the origin, but then I come back to zero again. And this additional factor coming from the uh, commutation term here is actually proportional to the area of the loop that I make in the phase space. It's like a geometric phase or it has a geometric component. Uh, and what it means is that by the end, when I've excited all the way back to zero, I've picked up a phase on the states that got excited. Right? And that's the origin of this uh, gate. So uh, what happens if I had two ions and I drove them with a laser? Uh, these would be actually the probabilities to see the ion in up-up states or in anti-correlated states or in uh, correlated down-down. 
And so here is a situation where the system started in down down, that probability would be one, right? And you see this sort of periodic behavior, right? Which uh, particularly in these uh, anti-symmetric states, right? It gets excited, de-excited, excited, de-excited. And this is the point here when actually there's no entanglement, there's no more motion going on. This is the time we would choose for a gate. And at that point, we're in a superposition of the up up state and the down down state, which is a bell state essentially, yeah? So the way we typically analyze that is to apply additional single qubit gates, which analyze what the phase relationship is between the two uh, components of the Bell state, the 0, 0, and the 1, 1. And the contrast of that tells us how good the coherence is between uh, these two states. So you see that the contrast here uh, is extremely close to 1, such that you can't tell from this plot. Uh, and we get fidelities in this system, which is a moderately operating trapped ion system these days. I think it's it's close to what state of the art is, but I'll tell you the results for state of the art in a moment. Um, and um, we get fidelities there, which is sort of 99.3% or so. So as, as a field that originates from atomic clocks, you have to then go and list all the painful things about your uh, experiment. Atomic clock is all about listing uh, your error sources, right? So we do that, and what you'll see is that quite a bit of the error actually in our case is coming from the fact that we have to um, connect to this motional motion of the iron. In a sense, that's one of the worst behaved bits of trapped ions, yeah? Uh, and uh, you see that that's contributing a few parts in 10 to the 3 to our interfidelity, and there's a bunch of other small factors as well which just add up, right? So recently, actually, I wanted to flag this. this was a beautiful result from uh, Georgia Tech uh, Research Institute in the US, where the, they produced the best quality bell states that I've seen so far using two qubit gates uh, with an error of now six times 10 to the minus four. So I, I think in our field, we're closing in on these levels which we want for fault tolerant quantum computing. Yeah, but still a bit of way to go. And we should bear in mind that usually this is an isolated result and not being used in an algorithm with lots of complexity going on. That's a very important point. Yeah. So I wanted to make an aside. How am I doing for time here? Yeah, I'm nearly an hour. Okay, let me, I just finish this little section and then I take a break and see if anyone wants to ask some more questions. So this gate mechanism that we have uh, is actually something that can be used in a different way to perform what we would call quantum simulations. And I just wanted to uh, show you a little bit of what the physics is involved in that. So the, the extra term that gives us this phase can actually be written in terms of an operator which acts on all the spins. So you see this SX operator is actually the sum of all the Pauli X operators on all the different individual ions that are illuminated by the laser. Yeah? And that gets squared. And when it gets squared, it either produces identity terms or it produces uh, pairwise interactions between all of these spins. Yeah? So these are products of Pauli operators. And so if you look at that sort of exponentiation, there's some sort of time dependence with a product of Pauli operators. Effectively, this can be thought of in terms of an effective spin-spin interaction that you produce, yeah? And the way we usually consider that is if you go to very large detunings, you're not really anymore doing big loops and exciting motion anymore, but you're rather exciting very small loops continuously. And then you can sort of uh, integrate out the motion, ignore it if you like, and just deal with these spin-spin interactions. But these are engineered and they're depending on your laser field. And so that can be mapped, if you like, to interesting models that you might have in solid state physics. So this would be the transverse Ising model. I'm working in a slightly different basis here. Uh, but the important things about this model, which is somewhat uh, one of those classic paradigmic peak paradigmic models, right, uh, is that it would be nice to control the uh, interactions uh, between all the individual spins. And that's something that is somewhat available in this trapped iron platform. So indeed, this has been realized in trapped ions. Here's one example uh, where people are actually working with a penning trap, yeah? And you see here a disk of, I think, 150 or so trapped ions. Uh, and you see that they're in a two-dimensional triangular lattice. Yeah, that's something that's controllable in the experiment to some extent. Uh, and these Hamiltonians were then implemented on this lattice in order to look at the uh, behavior of uh, such a Hamiltonian. Yeah? So these were investigations performed a few years ago. And one of the controls, as I said, is about uh, the interest in this parameter J. So uh, this model is solvable, for instance, if you get a homogeneous value of J for all of the different pairs of spins that you could pick. But it becomes more tricky if you get uh, different uh, styles of uh, this interaction J. 
So one of the keys in trap plans or one of the nice things is that actually this is controllable. And one thing that's controllable is the somehow effective range of the interaction. So here I'm sort of plotting the distance between the two ions by some different in indexes. And it's controllable in this setting uh, what the power law is of this drop off. Yeah. So to give you an idea of power laws that are sort of common, dipole, dipole interactions would have A equal to three. Yeah. And a purely long range interaction where all the couplings are the same, this would have A equal to zero. Yeah. So um, this is controllable in the trapped ion setting because we don't just have one normal mode. I've been talking as if we just excite one type of motion so far. But for instance, in this penning trap, there are hundreds of modes of motion. And if you stick your laser detuned from uh, one of them, well, it's also detuned from all the others. Yeah. And so you have to actually consider what's happening when you drive all of these modes simultaneously. So that detuning is actually an important tool. If you make the detuning extremely large, uh, so here they've chosen, I'm here plotting the detuning, then you get one megahertz, right? These plots are all about the distance between ions versus the value of J, essentially. So you can plot a line to this and you can see what this power law is. And if you make the detuning large, you get a one over R cubed dipole dipole type interaction. If you make it extremely short, uh, small, you get a short range interaction. Yeah. And this was what the sort of game that they these guys were playing with. It's sort of clearly illustrated in another experiment actually performed on a linear chain of ions in Innsbruck. So here, what you see is um, along the bottom here is plotted ion number. And initially one of the ions is excited. Only one of the ions is excited. And then this interaction Hamiltonian is turned on with a certain uh, value of A chosen, yeah? And what you see is that the uh, sort of the distortion of blue, which is no excitation, it, it propagates out in a certain cone, right? Uh, and you can see these propagations, there's all sorts of complex dynamics going on here. But one thing they could do was they could vary the range of this interaction. And you should see that the opening cone as a result then uh, uh, changes, yeah? Uh, so it's broader here, it's propagating out faster than it was in this direction here. And that's corresponding to the fact that it's a longer range interaction. Yeah. So this is a sort of nice pictorial illustration I find of the fact that these range of these interactions is engineered. So that in a sense is where the state of the art in quantum control is today, is in these long iron chains, right? This is where we uh, people realize what I would call NISC quantum computers, right? So quantum simulation experiments have been performed in pole traps, at least with up to around 50 qubits in Chris Monroe's group uh, in Maryland. Uh, people are performing variational algorithms with up to around 20 qubits. There have been various demonstrations of little gadgets for error correction. And one of the nice things here is that there's this all-to-all -all connectivity. So I can you know, apply a laser here and a laser over here, and I can get these two ions to interact or I can pick any other pair and I can also get them to interact because this iron chain is a rigid structure. These vibrations are vibrations of the entire chain. Yeah. So that's the form, sort of form that it takes in these startup companies in, in trapped iron quantum computing, one in Innsbruck, one in Maryland, one starting up in Oxford, if you like. But, and I give it the but, uh, is that this is really the state of the art, but at some level, this is a many body system. So trying to scale it further becomes more and more complicated. And that's not what you want if you want to go to the 100,000 or whatever that you need for quantum error correction, yeah? So somehow there will be a limit somewhere here. I don't believe they've yet found it, uh, but we have to think of other approaches if we're going to scale uh, further. I think that's a good point to break. And then I go to maybe other approaches to scaling uh, in the second half of the lecture. Yeah. So any questions at that point? Okay. Um, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well. We five minute break, or I mean, is that a good thing to do? Or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then we can see uh, if questions come up during the break. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I'll go and get a glass of water then and I'll come back. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.
So, Professor Holm, can you uh, see some of the questions? Yeah, I could just go through them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. So, Rudy asks, could we one day see two linear chains on top of each other? Yeah. I think, well, you already saw in an earlier thing uh, two dimensional crystals. So, it's not impossible to make two dimensional crystals. Uh, they tend to be in the RF traps, they involve having all the ions being driven quite heavily with the RF field, which is a challenge, yeah, stability wise. Uh, in the penning traps, they um, have worked more stably, hence the reason I could show you that picture, if you like. Um, two linear chains could also be in two neighboring traps, if you like, but they have to be rather close together to get a good Coulomb interaction. So that's a bit the challenge, and I'll come back to that maybe later in the talk. Burak asks, what is the largest entangled state created for ions? Um, so one answer to that question is, I don't know, because of course, entanglement itself could be a rather complicated state and rather hard to diagnose. I think what I could tell you about is a simple state that people are able to verify, which is a, a, a GHZ state. So a superposition, if you like, of all the um, spins being up or all the spins being down with a good phase relationship. That's quite easy to characterize. And what I know is that I think AQT made one with 25 ions or so. So that's probably what the limit has been so far. Yeah. Are there any limits to use more than two lasers? I don't quite understand the question. If you want to do more complicated circuits, you have to be able to point lasers at every single ion individually in these sort of approaches. So um, that does create challenges optically. So Anya asks, uh, sounds like the error correction in these systems so far is rather basic. Error correction in any system so far is rather basic, yeah. Uh, in fact, I think that if you ask the experimentalists, they would say it was extremely complicated. Uh, but if you looked at it from a quantum computer point of view, you'd say it's too basic because it doesn't work yet. Uh, so in a certain sense, error correction is still the tough thing on the horizon, I would say, yeah. Um, good. Uh, as mentioned in your error budget, the phone on heating is a major source of error. Is it due to the electrode ion spacing? Yeah. Uh, if so, are microfabricated traps bad owing to their small ion electrode spacing? Yeah, so the, the basic deal is that there is uh, noise on the potentials on the surface of the electrodes, which we don't fully understand. And indeed, that affects the ion much worse if the ion is closer to the surface. Um, so indeed, the results I was showing you there were actually from one of the most microfabricated traps that I think anyone did high quality gates on. So this 99.3, if you like, uh, is coming from a trap with only a few 10 microns ion electrode spacing. Uh, and it is more of a challenge for these microfabricated traps. And in a sense, that's why these systems with just a long chain of ions, it's one reason why they've been more successful in scaling so far, because um, they just use a big trap made of big pieces of metal that are very far from the ions and that the noise is less, yeah. Mikolai Roguski asks, INQ is planning to double the number of qubits in their quantum computer every year. Do you know how they are going to trap and control more than a hundred ions? Uh, that's the second half of the lecture, yeah. Um, Regarding the readout procedure, would a dynamical stop readout, stopping the laser emission after the collection of the first? Yeah, that's a very good question. So actually one thing that we've been doing in recent years was taking our detection bin, which usually is sort of a 200 microseconds and binning it into separate 20 microsecond bins and then processing the counts that we see in those bins and stopping the detection early if we think the fidelity has got good. And one of the things it helps with actually is the fact that, uh, as I pointed out, there was a tail in one of the distributions, which was due to the fact that the qubit in that case does have a probability to decay. Uh, and it's that sort of error can actually be largely eliminated by using these Bayesian uh, readout procedures by using the information about when the photons arrive, not just uh, that a certain number arrived in a certain bin. So we do that, yeah. And Tom, hi Tom, uh, by how much does the two qubit gate fidelity drop if you go from a small to a larger qubit system with the all to all connectivity? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm gonna quote numbers off the top of my head, but um, you know, the state of the art gates that people do as I showed are sort of now in the sort of error rate of one part in 10 to the three. 
I think you would find with the sort of 15 iron chain that more typical gate fidelities are, uh, error rates are a percent. Yeah, so it's a factor of 10 or so worse. Yeah. And probably there's some variability there if I think about it. Yeah. Good. So I should proceed. And I think this part will be shorter. It should be shorter because we don't have all that much time. So, yeah, let's see how we get on. Yeah. Uh, good. So. Yeah, so just a quick reminder then that um, in order to do real problems in quantum mechanics, um, like something like molecular structure, uh, you can go to your resident computer guy and uh, Matthias Troyer used to be ours and he would say, you know, you need about a million qubits and 10 to the 17 gates, right? Uh, and what that means is that if you have failure rates on your gates, which are not one part in 10 to the 17, you don't have a very good uh, accuracy for your algorithm. That's a very crude way of putting it. And part of the overhead in the million qubits and the 10 to the 17 is actually because you need to perform quantum error correction to get the errors down. Yeah. So how does it work and what's the real challenge there, right? Here is kind of a cartoon view over this whole landscape of an error correction code. So the, the basic deal in quantum error correction is that you can notice to yourself that errors in physics, physics is mostly a local thing. Things happen in points in space very often, yeah? So there's two things you can crudely think of doing in quantum error correction. You can delocalize the information, right? Make sure the information is spread over as many systems as possible, because then if one of them gets impacted, you probably have a minimal impact on the information. Yeah? But the other thing that gives you is a much larger Hilbert space, actually, because you've got the Hilbert space of a large number of qubits now. And that allows you to make measurements that can allow you to repeatedly check for errors and to correct where you see errors happening, right? And so in this tessellated plane here, what we have is all of these little balls representing individual ions, for instance. This is actually a tessellation coming from something called a topological color code. And the basic game is how do you check for errors, right? The challenge is that if you ask the values of the qubits, that will kill the qubit, right? So instead, you don't ask that sort of thing. You ask, are the values of these four qubits correlated with each other, right? And the idea is that if you didn't have errors, then they're always correlated with each other. But we don't know if they're, what state they're in particularly, right? But an error will flip one of them, and you will find a correlation where, well, you'll find a situation in which an odd number of them are up and an even number are down, instead of either four being up or two being up, actually. And even is also an acceptable. Uh, but having one of them flipped is bad, right? So you keep on going looking, are these correlated? Are these guys the same, essentially? And you repeat that. And the daunting thing is that, you know, today probably any error correction code anyone's doing is on sort of a small number of these uh, atoms, right? Seven or so. And that can tolerate that one of them goes bad, right? But actually, given the fact you have faulty gates and things, it seems like what we need to do is make this entire landscape full of qubits uh, in order to really protect from errors, uh, even with the error rates that I was quoting earlier, the extremely good error rates of sort of 10 to the minus four. So just to give some basic uh, estimates of that, this is a surface code, so it's not quite the same as the one I showed up here, but you can sort of plug in numbers that say if the error per two qubit gate is a five times 10 to the minus four, uh, you'll need about 2,700 uh, individual physical qubits for a logical qubit, right? So you see that's thousands and that's more than we have in the lab today. So we're a long way, I think, from uh, quantum computers yeah. uh, that are fault tolerant, that is. So just to give you a state of the art a couple of years ago in our system, so we, we are measuring correlations and performing feedback on them, right? So a special feature of this system was that there was an ion chain with uh, two beryllium ions uh, and a calcium ion. So there were two species here, yeah? Gates. Uh, these are the multi-qubit gates, could actually be performed on all three of these at the same time, right? But the key thing about having a second species was that we can perform measurement, uh, we can recall the ion chain, we can reinitialize the ion chain, uh, and we can use the detection, if you like, for the conditional feedback, which would close the loop and allow us to stabilize the system. So there's a bunch of things that had to go into that. Uh, one of the things that's very key, but not in the sort of uh, gates you have to do in quantum computing is that if you start to do detection, you have to have a very low crosstalk readout. Your readout itself should not back have a back action that's undesired on your qubits. Yeah? 
So that's a challenge in ions because they're all identical if we use the same species, right? And if they're all identical, that means if I scatter photons from this one, they can be reabsorbed at the next one and cause an error, yeah? So what we had to do is use this different species, right? Uh, and then we could do these feedback cycles. And I just quickly flash up again, these sort of graphs where over a number of rounds of measurement, this is the case where we don't do any feedback and you see fast decay of correlations in this case. And this is the case where we do do feedback where you see that we've somewhat stabilized the system. Yeah? But there's still some way to go. That's really on two ions. People have now realized circuits for encoding nine ion uh, uh, logical qubits, if you like. They do basic detection, but they can't do this same type of operation on these larger systems. So how do we go in terms of scaling? How do we think about scaling big, right? And there's two things you can think about. One is that Part of the problem is that you get a many body system. So in order to improve operation fidelities again, then the thing to do is to go modular, right? And going modular involves isolating small numbers of qubits. So two suggestions sort of fill our minds in terms of doing that in our field. One is that one can take uh, an electrode structure and make many electrodes out of it. So all of these little segments here are separate electrodes. And then what this allows you to do is to apply potentials so you can move the ions around within the chip structure and only move them to a place where the laser beams are when you want to do gates there uh, and hide them in a memory reason, region when you don't want to use them. Yeah? So there's several of us groups performing uh, transport operations. Honeywell, this is the approach that they're taking in their quantum computing. And I think INQ also has this on their most recent roadmap. Yeah? So there's a challenge there, your chip and your iron trap gets much more complicated. There's lots and lots of connections to electrode structures. You wonder how do I get laser beams into all these different zones? And I'll show you a possible solution to that later on in the talk. The other approach that people think about, and again, INQ has, uh, I mean, Chris Monroe actually was one of the pioneers of this at Maryland, so it's natural for INQ to go in this direction, is to get ions to emit photons and then connectorize the traps via optical fiber links. Yeah. So here I'm showing an example where we're sort of uh, still thinking forward about optical cavities surrounding the ion trap that allow to interface to photons, but I'll concretize that in just a moment. So two types of modularization, one which is kind of on chip and still fairly local, but deterministic. When I move an ion, I know where it goes. In this approach here, it's not aiming to be deterministic, but rather to create entanglement between different uh, systems, yeah, which can then be used as a resource for uh, scaling. So let me come to this quantum CCD architecture. That's the on-chip approach, right? So you can think that you might have done a two-qubit gate somewhere over here. Uh, what do you need to do now to do further gates on different qubits? Well, you start to, you change the potentials on your electrodes such that you move the ions. Maybe you take one of them into a memory register. You move this one up here and another one comes to another region. You then combine them again and you have to do a two qubit gate. And one of the challenges is that this moving can heat the ions up or get them in an excited state, right? Emotional. And that means that your gates here won't be as good, right? So actually that's where initially these second species of ion came in was to use it just to collect together with these. They all repel each other. And so if I cool down this ion, well, I cool down all the other ions, right? So I can reinitialize the system fully. And actually the first results from that were at NIST uh, performed with magnesium and, and beryllium ions. And the key there is that if I shine a laser on magnesium, the qubit in beryllium is completely unaffected because it's not a resonant uh, light field. So in terms of the photon approach, the, the primary approaches that we see there is to try and take photons emitted from two ions, so single photons from two ions, combine them on a beam splitter and make a measurement of the two. Yeah? So the key uh, physics there is this hong mandel effect that says that identical photons will always come out in the same direction. So they'll always only make one of these detectors click. So how's that used to generate entanglement? Well, when we emit a photon from an ion, we can do it in such a way that depending on which state the ion decayed into, it emits a different color of photon. Yeah? And if we do that at two locations, we end up with a situation where indeed, sometimes if the ion states are correlated, we'll get the same color of photons and only one detector will click. But there will be situations in which a different color of photons comes to the beam splitter 
And that may allow us to make both detectors click. And indeed, what we find on an analysis is that if both click, then you can say that the ions are projected into a singlet state, an entangled state that looks like this. Now, the problem with it uh, and the limitation, uh, it has been used to entangle ions separated by a meter or so. Uh, and the challenge with it is that the collection efficiency of light from an ion into an optical fiber is rather low. Yeah? So in this initial experiment, it's actually they were only producing entanglement once every eight minutes. Recently, that's been got up quite a bit, actually, to 180 hertz. So this is sort of five millisecond wait times. And fidelities are moderately good, such that I think uh, distillation protocols could produce high fidelity entanglement. But still, this is one major area to work on is the rate of entanglement you can generate with these sort of uh, systems. Yeah. So likelihood is it eventually requires optical cavities. And actually, there were really nice results just a few weeks ago from Ben Lanyon's group in Innsbruck, which were showing that uh, with a sort of 50% efficiency, the, the photon is coming out into the desired channel using an optical cavity. So this approach is in progress, but less mature, I would say. Yeah. So one of the problems I pointed to was the challenge of uh, delivering light to ions in, in lots of different uh, trap regions. Yeah. So let me just illustrate some recent work we've been doing there. So if you came into my lab today, you'd probably see really a mess of optics. It looks like uh, uh, really a big room full of optical elements here. Yeah? And the core of it is this vacuum system. And the vacuum system holds this, this little fairly chip-like uh, ion trap. So the question is how to scale up. You know, usually here we're operating with maybe one, maybe two zones of the trap. But how can we scale up the optical delivery to really deliver light to many different locations simultaneously? And one key element there is to think, well, couldn't I put the light through the chips uh, that I use to trap the ions and deliver the light directly out of the chip. Yeah, So this is where photonics starts to meet uh, ion trapping. And it's been something which really started a few years ago. Yeah, uh, But they had challenges. And one challenge was getting light into the chips, actually. So they had a huge loss in optical power going from input to ion. So that's something that we were fortunate that Karan Mehta, who did this work, came to work for us. And then he built this device I showed you initially which has basically an eight channel fiber array going into waveguide structures in this chip to do exactly this job. And one of our main things was trying to get rid of this 33 dB loss from input to iron because that doesn't limit doing single qubit gates, but for the two qubit gates, it actually was a big problem. They couldn't do that. So how do these chips look? Well, now it's not, here's a, a layering, if you like. This, when people make chips, they lay da layer down multiple materials, yeah? So this is on a silicon substrate. We get these made in a commercial foundry. There's some glass, essentially silicon dioxide put down, some silicon nitride layers put down, more silicon dioxide. Then we worry because ions are sensitive to charge. We worry about charges mucking around in the bottom here. So there's actually a metal plane here to shield uh, the system, right? So provide some guard. And here are the trap electrodes sitting on the top. And the two key level layers here are silicon nitride has a very different refractive index to silicon dioxide. So we can uh, confine light within these waveguide structures. Here. So I won't tell you too much about that. One of the nice things that's done in this process here uh, is actually that the mode size of the uh, confined light can be changed. So actually here is what we have near the edge of the chip where we want to stick fibers to the chip. And indeed that gives us low a good overlap between the modes from a fiber and the modes on chip. And here it is better for routing light around the chips. And then to direct the light to the iron, what happens is it hits a basically a Bragg grating, which is made by e-beam lithography. Uh, and this scatters light with remarkably high efficiency, something like a 50% efficiency. Light comes from the waveguide. It gets expanded up onto this grating and gets focused down to a small spot uh, on the iron itself. So here's a top view of the chip. You can zoom in and uh, the ions sit above these locations here. And these are actually the waveguide structures if you look carefully that you can see with these diffraction uh, gratings in them. Uh, and we work very hard if you like to get the losses down. So in particular the fiber attached losses are now sort of on the one and a half dB level. And what this meant was that we easily had, even with moderate laser power, we were able to do gates. And actually these are the results I showed you earlier were from a chip which was the first chip to do these gates using the integrated uh, delivery of light. Yeah. And this appears to us much more scalable because already you see here, there are multiple zones that we could potentially operate with 
uh, as long as we can plug light into three fibers simultaneously, which is sort of a common task in optics. So uh, where does this go? There are all sorts of additional features we'd like. You see some more advanced chips that we made that have regions. You see all these red lines are basically where the waveguides go. And there are lots of different regions here, even a region here where we might try and trap uh, five ions and address uh, individually five ions with these uh, individual fibers. Um, there's a whole, this, this is really the beginning, right? So there's more complication coming to these setups, but it starts to become partially a fabrication problem. And what you also see a little bit is that there's a materials challenge of exploring the best materials to use in this system. So there's a, uh, not just a, a sort of iron trap physics problem, but also a trying to think what's the best compatible sets of materials to use. So how much more time do I have? Uh, not too much longer. Let me say something uh, in the last five minutes about maybe a slightly different approach, okay? So one of the challenges we have, I think, in iron traps, as I would say, is the use of this RF trapping. And so you can see these beautiful pictures, uh, and these pictures come from ions which are trapped at the zero of this RF electric field. But that can only be a one-dimensional zero. Again, that comes from Laplace's equation, right? So if you start to go into two dimensions with these RF traps, you start to have driven RF motion, which then causes uh, problems in the interaction with the laser in the sense that uh, or it can produce fluctuations. Yeah, uh, And it also actually produces slightly unstable behavior of the ions. So it looks to me like we're not going to a million this way. And RF has a few other problems. Yeah, So one thing is that the radio frequency potential is somehow a different potential to what you use generate from your electrodes to produce static potentials. And in particular, electric fields in the lab can change or in your electrode structure can change. And that will move the static potential relative to the radio frequency potential and change things like how much RF motion you have, which changes the interaction with the laser. Yeah. So there's always a problem and you will find in our labs, we're always doing micro motion compensation, trying to overlap these two essentially. Uh, as referred to earlier, there's a problem of, um, uh, well, actually a slightly different problem. One problem is that if you have to put radio frequency voltages on chips, then the chips get hot. And just to give you an impression of that, here's a heat map of Sandia National Labs looking at actually a particularly bad chip of theirs, uh, but looking thermally at it because they're worried about the fact it heats up. Yeah? And as you start to scale, you'll dump more and more heat if you have to put RF to more and more places. So actually one of the things we're, we're pursuing in a separate project now is to try and use these penning traps in microfabricated architecture as well. Yeah. So there the, the trick is not to use dynamic fields like the radio frequencies I've been talking about, but just to add a static but homogeneous magnetic uh, field to the electric fields you have. So in this case, here's a symmetric potential. You see it confines along the Z axis, which actually is vertical in this graph but it's a potential hill in the radial directions, X and Y, right? So you can see, think in the radial directions, the iron could sit at the top of the hill, it's gonna fall off. That's the usual problem of Laplace's equation. But if I add a magnetic field, then I get a situation which means that if the iron's to fall off, it has to make a velocity uh, radially, yeah? And then what the magnetic field is going to do through the Lorentz force is it'll make, uh, the force will be perpendicular and it'll take the iron off around this loop. Yeah? And indeed, under circum circumstances, that can be produced uh, to confine the iron close to the axis of the trap. Yeah? So now with completely static fields, it's possible to trap these uh, ions. And that's what's nice about that is that they're stable and there's no power dissipation. Yeah? So just looking at the time. So our approach to that then is to try and make lattices above a chip where the electrode structure of the chip defines, and there I've drawn that with these disks here, if you like, defines where the ions should sit above the, above the chip. And the challenge here, and it relates to the question that was asked earlier, is that you need the Coulomb interaction to do gates, right? So these ions should be close together. But in order to make tight packing, you need to bring these ions close to the surface. Yeah, and as you go closer to the surface noise, uh, there's a noise problem there. A bit of an unknown problem because nobody ever built small penning traps, but certainly in RF traps, then there would be a noise problem. Yeah. So uh, with that in mind, then we've been pursuing that. It 
people have considered this approach with RF traps, but we think it's much more promising in the penning trap because the potentials can be stronger. Uh, and I'm going to flick through that. One of the major advantages uh, is related uh, to the fact that the magnetic field provides confinement, but it's homogeneous. And what this means is that when I think about this architecture where I'm transporting ions, in the RF trap, what I have is a situation where I have to go along the line where I have zero electric RF electric field. And if I try to go right or left in two dimensions, I get large driven RF motion, which people can cope with, but it's, it's tricky to design around. Okay. Uh, in the penning trap, what's very nice uh, is that the second field, if you like, the replacement of the RF is a very homogeneous field. And so I can now think to myself that I can just move uh, static potential wells, I can start to make them dynamic in an adiabatic way, and I can move them essentially in 3D by varying static potentials, rather than having to worry about any large driven RF motion, rather than having to worry about aligning with this uh, RF null that I have to always worry about in the RF traps. So with that, that's something we start to build. It looks a bit like Thomas the Tank Engine. It's got a chimney and a big magnet, yeah, and the vacuum system fits inside that. Uh, but this is ongoing work and you know the open question for the rest of the year will be can we load these systems at all this is a new system so we have to find this out yeah but somehow that excites me because to me uh getting things into the domain of static fields with no power dissipation is a big win compared to where we sit today with uh, uh, dynamic systems so with that uh thanks for your attention i left enough time i hope for questions so we're in the sort of NISC era, right, where I think probably 100 error prone qubits is a, a good number to shoot for. But we simultaneously, there's a lot of work going on in realizing probably smaller systems, maybe less sort of um, state of the art in terms of qubit number, but really focusing on the approaches of how to go to larger qubit number in the longer term. And that's starting to be utilized by people like Honeywell uh, in, the, in these companies, if you like. So two contributions we've made from that recently. One is uh, to using this integrated optics to do two cubic gates. That was something that we had last year, if you like. Uh, and another, which is hopefully to come, is this possibility to do things in penning traps instead, which I think adds a lot of flexibility and, and takes us into two dimensions in a way which we didn't have before. So with that, thanks for uh, listening. And I look forward to your questions of which I already see one, yeah. So Santosh asks, why not use a small permanent niobium magnet, uh, maybe on a translation stage to change the strength or to change shielding? Yeah. So the fields we need, and I, I didn't mention, are sort of on the level of several Tesla. So they're rather high, high fields. And it's actually pretty important to us from the point of view of uh, for fluctuations in those fields that the field is homogeneous, i.e. the yeah, essentially, if there is a vibration and you're sitting within a field which is not homogeneous, you'll see a fluctuation in the magnetic field. Yeah, and that will actually lead to that will change the energy separation of our qubits. It'll produce dephasing of our qubits. So we're probably uh, in this first shot, we may be being overcautious, but we've tried to be extremely cautious about uh, exactly which magnet we chose to get high homogeneity and very good temporal stability of the field. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, I have a question. Um, are you aware of any work that's trying to interface cracked ion qubits with other varieties of uh, qubits? Yeah, I mean, the yes. So uh, there were certainly considerations of this. The, the optical entanglement is one way in which people did examine this at the time. I think people tried to create entanglement. Maybe they did between like quantum dots and, and trapped ions in this probabilistic way. It didn't really solve any of our sort of scaling challenges, I would say, uh, because in a sense, uh, it, you still had the problem that the ion photon coupling was the limit sort of thing, yeah? Then in more recent years, people more from the point of view of just examining interactions have started to play around with Rydberg um, atoms and other types of atoms near ions. And I think that's something that could happen, but you have to bear in mind that uh, there's this RF electric field and Rydberg and things are, somewhat sensitive to RF electric fields. And then thirdly, people have thought about and maybe are returning to um, possibilities to interface ions with uh, superconducting circuits, for instance. And I can just tell you my thoughts on that were that I did the calculation and the Rabi 
rates don't look too bad. It's sort of 10 kilohertz or something like that that I could see for the coupling. But the problem is that the frequencies are very different. So the, when I'm talking about that coupling, it's between the motion of the iron and the superconducting microwaves. Uh, and then uh, you have a problem that the motion is at a megahertz and the superconductor is at several gigahertz typically. Yeah? And it's not totally easy to solve that problem to the extent that you're prepared to build a dill fridge in order to find out about it. Now, some people are starting to actually uh, go back to the possibility to trap electrons above uh, circuits. And that would use many of the same techniques, but you lose laser cooling and detection. So there's sort of a trade off there. Great, thanks. Um, okay. Um, I have one more question <laughs> that I'm personally curious about. Um, I work in like more uh, with more solid state uh, quantum systems, and we use uh, simulation tools like COMSOL or HFSS to simulate our systems. And I was wondering what are the common simulation techniques in trap time? Yeah, so I think the it's not so much simulating the trapped iron itself. Yeah, the trapped iron, we probably do usual things, um, uh, Python libraries with quantum stuff, yeah. So for the trap design, we are certainly using, we, we in our group are using COMSOL and then there are other sort of boundary element methods that are a bit more efficient sort of thing for doing some of these simulations. That's mainly electrostatics and not electrodynamics. Um, then we, also are doing simulations now for um, the waveguides and delivery of optics and design of optical fields. Uh, and that uses a slightly different package and Lumerical I think gets used there along with COMSOL and things like that, yeah. So these are the, probably the standard packages that we're using for simulation, I think, yeah, of our system, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Okay, now we have some questions in there. Oh, good, okay. What are gate fidelities in iron trap qubits? Is optimizing readout a bigger issue than optimizing gate operation? So I think like certainly readout in our, our setup, well, so yeah, I'll just give you a list, okay? So we think we can do optical pumping with better than uh, one part in 10 to the, or roughly one part in 10 to the five error. We think we can do uh, single qubit gates. Oh, then the detection, I think it's not, difficult to realize one part in 10 to the four. Single qubit gates, if the system is tuned up, one part in 10 to the four is totally doable, yeah? Um, but you can slip from that in various ways. Two qubit gates, the best that was ever done was six parts in 10 to the four. And more typically, I would say we're running around a percent error. So you can see there's a difference between best performance and re reliable. Um, and so in that sense, readout, for us, re readout is extremely robust. I, I think that's the lesser issues certainly than gate operations. And I think in any system, really the two qubit gates at some level are gonna limit things because you know, if you can use two qubit gates that are extremely high fidelity, you can start um, copying information uh, into entangled states of many systems and you can beat your readout error as long as you have a lot of sort of excess quantum systems sitting around. So then Anya, what are the main missing engineering skills in the trapped iron approach in your view? I wouldn't like to say that they are missing as such, but there are very few people certainly working on, I mean, one thing that we certainly have got a lot of interest in at the moment is this integration of optics and electronics in chips. Uh, and we're doing that in a slightly, with different constraints, if you like, to sort of standard optoelectronics. And so, uh, that's where I think there's a growth market in terms of people we need uh, for engineering skills. There's a, a lot of need still in sort of FPGA programming, uh, embedded software, um, even the software control because these systems get more and more uh, complicated. Uh, there's probably room, uh, but it's not so sort of easy to sort out for, well, I mean, another area of optics that's interesting is sort of, um, modulators and uh, multiplexed modulation of light, right? So typically a lot of these things you can find at 15, 50 nanometers where communications works. But if you ask for it at 729 nanometers and even worse, if you asked for it at 300 nanometers, uh, people don't have the materials yet. So there's a bunch of, I think engineering that could be done there. And there's, our field is not necessarily trained in that area yet, right? So in a certain sense, the field is a bunch of atomic physicists, probably about 10 years ago with addition of FPGA and engineers and things like this. And the optics stuff is sort of starting now. Yeah, we're, we're nested in that. Yeah. 
And then Leonardo, um, who indeed has been working on integrated optics uh, uh, in my group, so he's a bit biased. Do you think that the idea of integrating in chip, not only optical couple as possible yes i do uh i think the things yeah so i mean i talked to my colleague rachel grange about this a little bit and things we are nervous about and we were we were thinking of getting test samples and things are just the uh intensities of light that we would like to use versus what she's typically putting through and we're doing it at a shorter wavelength than she's used to so in in that sense these various aspects have to be examined for these any new technology, when you do it at a new wavelength, you have to examine it and you have to look for new materials, for instance, which uh, I think you're doing at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, maybe one more thing. There was some kind of some breaking news in the field, right? Uh, Honeywell and Cambridge Quantum Computing, who are actually coming to give us a talk uh, later today, announced a merger mm -hmm. uh, very recently. And could you share your opinion uh, on that, how that might change the landscape in Europe? Um, yeah, I mean, in Europe, not so much because they're sort of, well, it depends on whether you consider UK Europe still, right? I mean, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, Cambridge Quantum Computing are very much the software side, as far as I see, or, you know, compilers and things like that. Honeywell are hardware. Right? Um, the hardware they do is very similar to the stuff we've been developing. They throw a much bigger team at it, in a sense. So they, they now do more complex stuff than we are somehow able to, which is which is good. I mean, somehow we will not throw a big team at it. Uh, I think it's an interesting merger. It's probably like, I don't, I think probably they can see synergies of what algorithms they might do on their system. And that might be quite useful to us if that's published and things like that. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I don't see that we, yeah, I don't see the direct, at the moment, I would guess that the hardware people at Honeywell fight a lot of hardware problems. Yeah. Uh, and so it's probably of more capturing future directions than it is directly day to day. Albeit that, you know, some of the things we did a few years ago and now um, are things like mid circuit measurement. Uh, and we were doing that for quantum error correction and Honeywell have an eye on that for algorithms. And there, I think that's fairly unique in this trapped iron setting, being able to do that well. And that's where, for instance, Cambridge uh, could be able to offer interesting possibilities based on their optimizers uh, and adapting that to having this mid circuit measurement would be very interesting I think so, yeah actually a final flag I wanted to put out so I wanted to thank the group I've talked about various things but uh, Tanya Bailey from my group will talk about completely different work uh, sort of quantum physics rather than uh, quantum computing I think uh, in a talk tomorrow so I should flag that so that people get yeah. Well then, um, if there are no more questions, thank you again, Professor Holm, for the wonderful talk. Um, oh, there's actually oh, there's one, one more question, if you can catch that, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, in the Paul trap, you described that the iron string moves as a quasi-rigid object, which you then use for two-cubic gates. Does that still work similarly in the 2D penning trap array? So uh, the, in the penning trap array, that's kind of the challenge will be to get these, each of the ions there is somehow at an individual site, so at an individual quadrupole center actually. And the, the question is, can you get these close enough together uh, to produce strong interactions to get this semi-rigid behavior? I think in a certain sense, looking towards quantum computing, actually having the entire string oscillate is probably not the best thing for producing really high fidelity gates consistently. And in a certain sense, error correction tells you, keep your operations local and keep your information non-local, yeah? So in a certain sense, you want to go a little bit away from this from the point of view of error correction. So in the pending trap array, that'll be how close can we get these individual sites together. But one of the things that we see uh, with local control of the potentials is that we might be able to just bring pairs of sites into resonance with each other and produce the coupling only when we need the coupling, essentially. And that will be actually a useful switch that we haven't got currently in the current setup. Great, uh, fantastic. Okay, so um, yeah, now uh, I suppose we're reaching our, our kind of desired time uh, to break for, for lunch. So thanks again. We really appreciate uh, you sharing your expertise. And yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. And thanks for all the great questions. Yep. Exactly. 
And uh, to the members of the conference, we'll see you back after lunch. For those of you in the Kiskit session, uh, we'll be back on Gather at 1400, so two o'clock. And um, for everyone else, we'll be back on this stream with uh, talks with both Cambridge Quantum Computing and IQM at uh, 4.15. So see you all then. <laughs>